cruel summer, extreme heat barrels toward the east, leaving tens of millions on alert for triple digit highs. Beachgoers in the south facing hot tub conditions. Definitely warmer than usual. So when could it all start to cool down? Al's tracking the latest. Plus, we're kicking it. USA! USA! We are in New Zealand where the fans are going wild for Team USA ahead of the big showdown versus the Netherlands. Close the foul. Lovely run. Great goal. Brilliant goal. So will the women score yet another victory? Two-time champion Brandi Chastain breaks it all down. Then going for gold. Today's the day one year out until Paris 2024. And we're celebrating with athletes live on our plaza. We'll take a look at the preps already underway as we get ready to say bonjour to the city of life. And rolling milestone. Mick Jagger turns 80 today. We'll look back at his amazing life and legacy and how the music icon is still satisfying fans all these years later. Today, Wednesday, July 26, 2023. From Fort Myers, Florida. Hi, Mommy and Megan. We start our mornings with today, every day, in San Jose. Have the trip from Louisville, Kentucky, in Nashville. On a girl's trip. With my grandma. From Milwaukee, Wisconsin. From Fairfield, California. Today's my birthday. Visiting from Garden City, Kansas. Sugar Land, Texas. Cookville, Tennessee. And Springville, Iowa. It's our first time in New York. From Monroe, Georgia. From Pikeville, Ohio, celebrating our 26th anniversary. From Lexington, South Carolina, today's my sweet 16. Go! Who can forget that? We are back 814 on this Wednesday morning Epic. with an iconic moment. Ah. Brandy Chastain's there, uh, that World Cup winning goal in the 1999. Never gets I, old. Getting kind of misty because that was such a great epic celebration. And Team USA is hoping to do that whole thing all over again for the third time in a row at this year's World Cup. We're going to talk to Brandy, in fact, in just a moment. Um, but first, NBC's Molly Hunter joins us from New Zealand where the U.S. women got a big, big game later tonight. Hey, Molly. Guys, good morning from Wellington, New Zealand, from a raging late night party. I am surrounded by American fans, very excited American fans from the American Outlaws, who cannot wait for that game against the Netherlands. Guys, let's hear it. As temperatures dip here in Wellington, New Zealand, the U.S. women are gearing up for tonight's big game against the Netherlands, marching towards that history-making goal, a third straight World Cup title. In their first round victory against Vietnam, eight U.S. players, including six starters, made their World Cup debuts, including superstar forward 22-year-old Sophia Smith scoring two goals. Veteran co-captain Alex Morgan saying afterwards, there's clearly room to grow. I think we saw a lot of glimpses of... Um our potential, um, but I feel like we weren't always clicking on the field. We caught up with the youngest player on the American team, 18-year-old Alyssa Thompson, who saw her first World Cup minutes in the second half. This has been a dream for me since I can remember. So being here and just being on this team with a bunch of players that I've always looked up to has been so amazing. Now the U.S. team traveling to their second New Zealand city for a much anticipated second match. This may be the windiest spot in all of Wellington, New Zealand, but what a view. You can see the entire city. You can even see that stadium where the U.S. will play the Netherlands. We've run into American fans who have traveled so far and wide to cheer on their team. I'm sorry, you said what? The winter? Yeah, yeah. This, this wind is brutal. Oh, it's freezing. Underneath those layers, Mitchell says he's sporting a Rose Lavelle jersey. The 28-year-old midfielder telling reporters today she's excited for a fun second match. They have a lot of different threats. I think they're technical, um, good on set pieces, so I think um, it's going to be a tough game.
The two teams are familiar. The Americans beat the Dutch 2-0 to win the 2019 World Cup. And again at the 2021 Tokyo Olympics. Of Tokyo 2020! In dramatic penalty kicks. And on her youngest teammates, Lavelle is full of respect. We have 14, like new players to a World Cup, but I think they're 14 really, really freaking good players. Now, did I mention it was late at night here in Wellington? We also just learned that U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken is in town. He met with the team. He'll be at the game tomorrow, but he's not going to be the only one at the game tomorrow. No. We love you, we love you, we love you, and where you go, we'll follow, we'll follow, we'll follow. <laughs> oh, nice. That's cool. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's Okay, if you're not pumped up Come now, on. okay, I know someone who's going to pump us up a little more. How about this? Let's welcome in U.S. soccer legend and two-time <laughs> Women's World Cup champion, our friend Brandi Chastain. Brandi, I can only imagine your heart's pounding for that this team. You know what it's like. You know what it feels like. What do you think they are going through right now as they approach tonight's game? This is a one game situation thinking about, you know, what are the things that they need to let into their focus and what things do they need to stay outside. No external things are going to make a difference. All the tools that they need, they already have. They have one another and they have to go out there and be themselves, which is easier said than done when you're playing a team like the Netherlands. You know, Brandy, so much has been made of, of, of the, the youth on, on our squad. So many first-time uh, World Cup players. You look at them in that first match against Vietnam, though, they went 3-0. It, it didn't seem like a young team. Uh, have you been surprised at all by how well they played considering their youth? Well, Craig, I think the question is a really good one. I think even though that they're World Cup newbies, they have been on the national team for a while. And so they've had big games. They've been playing in uh, professional leagues around the world, specifically the NWSL, where this team will be playing next year. And I think they already have a lot of experience. You know, they, they are they're new to the World Cup, which obviously is very exciting, as Alyssa Thompson said, you know, with players that they look up to. But they're professionals, and so they understand, you know, the routines of the, these types of games. And I think that they're not phased by what the World Cup is uh, presenting them. Brandy, there's 32 countries competing in the World Cup this year, which is the most ever. And you played in the inaugural one in 91. You led us to victory in 99. We watched that epic goal. What's it, what is it like for you to see how far the sport has come? Uh, of course, it warms my heart. I, I've been a big fan and a supporter of women's soccer for 50 years. Uh. <laughs> Can't believe I'm saying that. <laughs> um, and uh, and so, you know, to see it, expon its exponential growth since 1999 is phenomenal. And to watch this Women's World Cup with 32 teams, with 14 new players on the national team, with teams like Spain, England, Netherlands, Brazil, Sweden, Germany, Japan, all really potentially capable of winning this tournament. To know that the women, that women's soccer is leading the way for women's sports and women yes. in business and that we are making great change wherever it is that we are and wherever we go and that we are the richest, deepest well of talent that is out there and that television rights, sponsorships, mm -hmm. new teams like the Bay FC, which is the biggest is happening right now. Mm -hmm. This is the best time to be a women's soccer team. A go, player. go, Brandy, go. All right, you kicked it off. Uh, we can't wait to see what happens tonight. Thank you again, Thank Brandy. You, Brandy. A reminder, Brandy. Telemundo and Peacock are home of the Spanish language coverage of the World Cup. You can catch Team USA take on the Netherlands tonight. Coverage starts at 8.30 Eastern. Do not miss it.
837 now. We are back with our countdown to Paris 2024. Exactly one year from now, the opening ceremony of the Olympics will be getting underway. Organizers, athlete, fans, they're already getting ready. NBC's Keir Simmons joining us now from the shadow of the Eiffel oh. Tower. Keir. Keir. Hey, Keir. Hey, hey, Craig. Hey, guys. Good morning to you. The IOC president this morning describing this as a new era, giving us more details, for example, of how they plan to incorporate the beautiful sights of this city in the games as they move along. And down below the Eiffel Tower there, we have a live shot of this for you. The Olympic clock is now ticking. You'll see it says 366 days, not 365. That's, of course, because next year is a leap year. But what an amazing Olympic year it's set to be. This morning in Paris, the Olympic dream becoming reality. Hussein Bolt joining the celebrations on the Seine, helping unveil the 2024 Olympic torch. Boats have been taking part in test runs for an historic opening ceremony. It's beautiful. <laughs> the design of the torch, inspired by water, the Olympic flame will be carried underneath the Eiffel Tower for an opening ceremony like no other. Athletes on boats like this one as thousands line the banks of the Seine. It's going to be amazing. Pamela Combastet, a New Yorker who lives here now, hoping to be a torchbearer. I just think it would just be incredible to be part of that wonderful human chain. The Paris 2024 slogan, Games Wide Open. The venue's expecting huge numbers of spectators, more than 10 million. 120 miles of rail lines, costing over a billion dollars, will carry them across the city sustainably, organizers say. We'll encourage people to walk, we'll encourage people to take public transportation. And announced just this week, a unique Champions Plaza by the Eiffel Tower for the public to meet medal winners. Recent protests across France, soaring temperatures in Europe and high ticket prices haven't soured the excitement, according to Paris 2024. I can only imagine um, the amount of people who line these banks uh, for miles, so I'm excited, you know what I mean? The fastest man in the world, planning to be a spectator next year with his three young children, though as competitive as ever. Which country is going to win more medals, France or Jamaica? Definitely Jamaica. I OK, really I bet. I bet with you. See? <laughs> I'm guessing, guys, that Team USA may have a few things to say about that. Now, I talked about a new era. Look at this. They're out with the new swag. How about that? Oh, Trey chic, right? It looks good. Very good. Ah, très bien. All right. Thank you, Kier. <laughs> All right. Also with us from Paris, who else? NBC uh, Olympic primetime host, the man, Mike Tirico. Tirico, let's break down some of these sports. Let's talk swimming to start. Katie Ledecky won her first gold. I remember her sure. in London. She was 15. She'll be 27 in Paris. Mm -hmm. Is she expected to win gold? And how does the swim team look? She's still going, Hoda. It's amazing. Katie Ledecky, the World Championships are going on right now in Japan, and she has won another World Championship, equally Michael Phelps, and a number of World Championships over a span that uh, they have won. So she is in rare air when it comes to not just U.S. swimming, but all swimming. Now, in those distance events, she still remains the heavy favorite, but in some of the shorter events, quote shorter, like 400 meters, for example, uh, there's a definite great competitor in Ariane Tippis from Australia who set a world record and beat Katie Ledecky at these world championships. So this will be a very interesting Olympics with competition for the U.S. in the pool, but figure Katie Ledecky to be right there and probably on the podium one more time. Mike, it's Jacob. I got to ask you about gymnastics. Everybody is talking about gymnastics because they've got a lot of familiar faces expected to return. Simone, number one, she's competing in the U.S. Classics, I think this month. Yeah. How does she stack up mm -hmm. against the current yeah. class of U.S. Uh, gymnasts? I should just turn to Hoda because she has all the <laughs> gymnastics every time we're at the Olympics. Oh, no. But uh, no, doubt, no doubt Simone Biles next weekend, not this coming weekend, but the following weekend outside of Chicago, 
competing in an elite competition, any competition for the first time since we saw her in Tokyo three years ago. That will have the eyes of the gymnastics world focused on that event as she tries to come back. Remember, she won five medals in the, in the games before that in Rio. Two, none of them gold when she was favored to win five golds in Tokyo. And we remember all of the issues she had. But it was pretty dramatic last month or so when she said she's going to come back. So, Simone, Suni Lee, there are a ton of names. It's not that big a team. Yeah. There's a lot of talent. It's going to be a very interesting 52 weeks for sure. Hey, Mike, so we've talked gymnastics. We've talked swimming. Let's talk Talk track, always a big one for Team USA as well. Noah Lyles just broke that yeah. huge record recently. How does our track squad look, Mike? It looks really good, Craig. You know, I think one thing we're going to see with a lot of the teams, a lot of familiar names because instead of four years between games, when the Tokyo Games got pushed back to 2021, that meant a three-year gap. So a lot of the athletes, like Noah Lyles, like Sydney mclaughlin Lavroni, incredible athlete for the women in 400 meters. She won the hurdles in the 400 meters in Tokyo. She's been competing in the 400 flat without the hurdles and has a chance to compete in that event at a gold medal level as well. I think we're going to see a lot of people turn right back around. Three years is less than four. And we're going to see, I think, a great performance like we did in Tokyo from the U.S. track and field team. That'd be great. So, Mike, basketball. I mean, we've had such a legacy uh, when it comes to gold medals. What, what's the team looking like? What are their chances this time around? Well, Al, the women's basketball team has always been so good. They have won seven straight gold medals. They have a chance for eight unprecedented when you're talking team sports. Uh, we know, watching the WNBA, how many talented players there are. The real roots of Title IX from over 50 years ago shows itself so well in soccer and especially in basketball. And on the men's side, I got one for you. Steph Curry's done everything. Uh, NBA MVP, multiple NBA world champion, hole in one and winner of the celebrity golf tournament in Tahoe. But he's never competed in the Olympics. So Steph Curry in the Olympics would just add to this entire flair that we're going to see here in Paris. Uh, I, I can tell you, being here the last three or four days, had dinner last night with the mayor of Paris and the head of the IOC, the energy for this is so palpable and so real, mm -hmm. and we're already. 366 days away. Yes. Cool. Mike Tarico. Notice how he name dropped. Oh, I just had dinner with the mayor of Paris. Oh, look at me. I'm Mike Tarico. Oh, ooh, la la la. I'm just a reporter. I'm just a reporter sharing facts with my friends in the morning. That's all I'm doing. It's important reporting. Don't listen to him, Mike. Don't listen to him. It's jealousy. That's what it is. Yeah. Safe travels, Thanks, Mr. Tarico. Thanks, Mike. There you go. See you, Mike. It. Oh, man. Uh, and by the way, folks, here's your reminder. Save the date. The Paris Olympics and Paralympics coming to NBC and Peacock next July. I'm officially excited. Let's, Let's go. go. I know. Me too. Me too. All right, guys. Uh, still ahead. We're checking out swimsuits for all body types and all occasions to get you through the rest of this very hot summer. But first, this is today on NBC.
Welcome back this morning on Today Style Summer Swimsuits, which will come in handy if you're taking a dip to beat this brutal heat. So here to walk us through some great options for every body type and every price point is our friend Liz Plosser. She's the editor in chief of Women's Health. Liz, good to see you. Great to be so here. So it's still a time you can get good deals on swimsuits even now as summer is kind of. This is the best time actually. Is there it? are so many sales and discounts happening and we still have a lot of summer left and it's very hot out. So okay. we have four excellent ones. So if you today. like water activities, you've got to get the bathing suit that Phyllis is modeling for us today. Talk about this suit. Yeah. Yes, this is amazing. Come on. This is so cute. Phyllis is rocking the one piece racer back from Fabletics. Mm -hmm. It's got support and compression built in exactly where you want it. Love it. Phyllis has amazing sculpted shoulders, and I think this silhouette is just perfect for that body type. Phyllis, have you been doing pull-ups or something? I don't know what she's doing. She's almost 60 years old, if you can believe By it. By the way, Phyllis used to be a police officer, and this is her other career. We're so into Phyllis. It's great, it's sporty, and it's beautiful. Thank you, Phyllis. All right, if you want just a cute one piece, let's bring out Arlie. Hey, Arlie. Hey, Good. Arlie. I love How it. How adorable is this bright cute. green color? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I love You're it. I'm loving it. It's got this halter top to um, give you some extra support up high, and I love the cutouts here, yeah. which give you just a little bit of skin and exposure at the most flattering spot you could possibly want them. Arlie, that's good. And you see all the price points are they're they're very reasonable. reasonable. Again, look for sales. Lots of discounts happening right now. Yeah, this one's seventy-five dollars, which is not bad at all for that beautiful bathing suit. This is from Kalia, Carrie Underwood's brand. Oh. Yes. I love yes. her brand. Yes. All right, Arlie. Thank you, thank you. All right, let's get into the two-piece department. We've got Whitney. Whitney is rocking this cute, sporty two-piece. I love wow. this. This is from Walmart. I've never um, seen Walmart, a suit actually, like that. The tried and true brand. Yeah. It's got this cute knot on the front, and there's another one on the back of her waistline. What I love about it, this is such a great trend. She could put on some drawstring pants or high-waisted linen trousers and wear this out to brunch, dinner, dancing. I'm actually doing the same with my suit today. This is a left on Friday top that I've paired with my suit. Wait, what? Yes. That's a bathing suit this top is a bathing and your suit. suit? That's right. This is an Argent suit, left on Friday top, but you can do this with one pieces, with crop top tees like Whitney has on. And it's Whitney, can to, you show us yeah. just the, the shoulders? Because it looks like a tee. Like, that's yeah. so cute. Super cute. I'm into that. All right, Walmart. That's a great one. Whitney, thank you. All right, our final model is Tendrina. She yes. has got a cool tie-dye look. Is that pattern in, by the way, this time? You, this this, this neon tie-dye is so cool. It is trending right now. It looks mm. awesome with her skin tone. Actually, anybody could pull this off. This is the Babe Watch, and it's totally giving me Babe, babe Watch <laughs> vibes. I love the high-waisted leg, that tank scoop neckline. And all of our ladies have sandals on from Reef. You think of them for flip-flops, but they're making these super fashion-forward sandals that are they're so cute and comfortable, and they're all wearing these Gooder sunglasses, which range from about $25 to $35. They stay put, super cute. But they're called colors. Gooder? Gooder, G-O-O-D-R. Those are super, so let's bring out all of our models. Yeah, and we should out, point ladies. out, guys, I feel like summer's gonna be one of those things that starts in July and now ends in September. It's gonna go a lot longer, so there's more need for bathing suits later Absolutely. in the season. We got a lot left. And as we said, the pool and the, after this. right, great for every body type, uh, and they're just gorgeous. You guys, thank you so much. And to snag the swimsuits, and for even more favorites, all you have to do is head to today.com slash shop. We should mention that today does earn a small commission from the purchases. Thanks, Jim, we appreciate it. All right, we'll be back in a moment. But first, this is Today on NBC.
celebrated Mick Jagger's 80th birthday a few minutes ago. Mr. Roker, how about we do some more? In 20 years, Mick Jagger on a Smucker's jar. Yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. All right, let's spin those jars, see who we got today. First up, a happy 100th birthday to Gloria Brooke. She's a world traveler from Queens, New York, one of the first Americans to go to China in the 1970s. Holly Jackson of East St. Louis, Illinois, is 100. He is known as the Candy Man, worked at a candy distribution center for over 40 years. Wow. Happy birthday, sir. All right, happy 100th birthday to Dorothy Burris, better known as Aunt Doc from Whiting, New Jersey. She taught organ lessons and was loved by all of her students. Mm -hmm. Mary Ann Zamiti of Belmont, Massachusetts is 100, a proud graduate of Emanuel College and Tufts University. Barbara Baker is from Richfield, Connecticut, a retired concert cellist is 100. She says the secret to longevity, never giving up. And happy 100th birthday to Rita Sullivan, a tech savvy lady from Chicago. When she was 95, she told her son she was tired from staying up too late on Pinterest. <laughs> That's right. So she moved to Minecraft. All right. Before we get out of here, I got a quick crowd moment over oh, here. Okay. I am looking for Chloe, Chloe, Chloe. Oh, Chloe. Where are you from? Um, Buffalo. So, I, how old are you, by the way? I'm nine. Nine years old. And I understand you had a school assignment recently where you had to create an image of someone you admired. Is that right? Yeah. And and who did you who did you bring to life? Um, I did Hoda. Oh. Do you happen to have a picture of what you created? Yeah. Can I see it? Oh, 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 this is Chloe. Oh, that's Hoda Copy? That. Yeah. That's, Hoda never that's pretty better. spot on. Oh, Look at that. That's pretty spot Same on, jump, Chloe. Dude. Chloe, meet Hoda. Hoda, Chloe. Chloe, you're the sweetest. I can't believe you did that. Oh. Thank you so much. Oh my God, this is so touching and beautiful. I think we look the same. Yeah. Thank you, well Chloe. Done. Beautiful. All right, later on Hoda and Jenna, we got a celebrity photographer who's becoming a rising star. He's just 10 years old. First on the third hour, money matters. Everything you need to know when it comes to insurance for your home, your car, even your pet. All that after your local news. You are so sweet. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. What's shaking eggs and bacon? Hold what? on, I'm just going to say it. What? Badass. Oh, thank you. So do you think you'll act forever? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> We're going to have lots of fun yeah. this morning. Yeah. This morning on the third hour of today, burning up. The record setting summer temperatures now spreading. We're going to tell you if there's any relief in sight. Plus, are you ready for a rematch? An early test for the U.S. women's soccer team facing the country they defeated in the last World Cup final. We're previewing the action from New Zealand. Then later, last minute deals on a summer vacation from rustic resorts to peaceful mountains where you can still book a trip without breaking the bank. And we're taking our plants on a trip in Wellness Wednesday. The right way to move your indoor plants outside for the summer. Today, Wednesday, July 26th, 2023.
Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the third hour of today. What day is it? Hump day. Mike, 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 Mike. Mike. Ooh, I'm Al. Jeff was, he, you got it today, Jeff. Where yes, he did. Very, very impressive. Uh, Chanel, Dylan are off. We've got our good buddy, NBC News Now anchor, Savannah good Sellers. Good well, to hello. see you here. It's always, always great, great to have you. Thanks for having me back. And, and we've got a big hour lined up for you. And we've got, just have to start with this heat wave because because it will not quit. It's been stifling for weeks in the south and west. Well, guess what? Now the Great Lakes and the northeast bracing for a big jump in temperatures. 104 million people of us Americans are now under heat alerts. And as usual, folks head to the beach for relief. But here's the thing. Ocean temperatures also way up. In fact, one part of the Atlantic off the coast of Florida, triple digit temperatures. <laughs> Excuse me. And we're talking. I'm getting all choked, you choked up. up. Yeah. Well, it's that hot. <coughs> and the hot temperatures, a major threat to coral reefs. Mm -hmm. Anything over 86 degrees, hot enough to kill the coral. And so it's going to be really rough. I mean, we got so a full third of the country is under some sort of heat alert. Right exactly. Now. And the, the ocean temperatures are off the Gulf, in the North Atlantic, the Mediterranean, all uh, at record highs. And as we mentioned, that heat is on the move. Take a look at the maps. We go into this weekend. You'll see New York City, uh, 96 on Friday, 91 in Boston, uh, 104 in St. Louis. Temperatures do cool down as we get into the weekend. But heat related issues are going to be a big problem as you even move to the south. Look at this. That heat's not really going anywhere. It's just going to be hanging out. That's not even factoring in the heat indexes. Uh, and, and we want to mention from the National Weather Service, we talk about heat exhaustion mm -hmm. versus heat stroke. Yeah. Heat exhaustion, you're talking dizziness, nausea, and clammy skin. Okay. Okay. Heat stroke is throbbing headache, confusion, and hot, dry oh. skin. So if you think you're suffering from heat stroke, call 911 immediately. Well, there's the graphic there. Yeah. Right so there. Yeah. Especially yeah. as we've seen those hospitalizations up in places like Arizona Way up, unfortunately. Yeah. What, any relief coming? Well, as we said, in the Northeast, it will cool down. But, you know, from the Gulf Coast into the Southwest, it's staying hot into next week. All right. Yeah. Uh, heat's oh. the big story. The other oh, big right. story this morning, a lot of folks are talking about that health scare involving the son of NBA superstar LeBron James. Bronny James, uh, LeBron's oldest son, uh, he's actually preparing for his freshman year at the University of Southern California, went into cardiac arrest on Monday. He collapsed during basketball practice. The good news is this morning he is in stable condition. Uh, NBC's Kaylee Hartung has been following this story for us this mo morning. Katie, uh, Kaylee, what's the latest here? Well, that is the headline, Craig, that Ronnie James is in stable condition. So this really scary scene unfolded at USC's basketball practice on Monday morning. The team is preparing for a foreign tour coming up in a couple weeks. So this was an organized practice with the entire coaching staff and training staff there. It wasn't long into the practice that I'm told Ronnie James collapsed. He went into cardiac arrest and this staff jumped into action. 911 was called. An ambulance took him to the closest ER and there he went into the ICU. We know he was was in the ICU for less than 24 hours, which is very good news for what his future outlook could be. But yes, now he is in stable condition. We don't know what caused this at this time, um, but we expect to, to learn more in the coming days, Craig. So, so Kaylee, we understand this isn't the first time this has happened at USC. Last yeah. July, Vincent Iwichuku uh, was hospitalized after collapsing on the court. He made a full recovery. So did, in a way, this incident helped the USC training staff get ready for something like like this happening again? Yeah, you have to imagine that it did. I actually spoke to someone who was there that day that Vincent Iwichiku collapsed, and he praised the efforts of USC's coaching staff and training staff in that moment. So you can only imagine again that that experience prepared them for very quick action in the case of Bronny James. LeBron James and his wife, Savannah, they have absolutely expressed their gratitude and thanks for the actions that that staff took. Um, this is one of those things where you think this would never happen to us. This would never happen to someone our mm. on our team. But these staffs, they have to go through CPR and AED trainings. And in this moment, they were prepared, guys. Mm. Oh, Again, it's goodness. Goodness. Oh. great news that he is in stable condition oh, this morning. Okay. Kaylee Hartung for us. Kaylee, thank you.
All right, we're going to stay on some sports news now, but turn to some exciting stuff, a major soccer showdown at the World Cup. Ooh. The U.S. women's national team has a big challenge ahead tonight. That's right, facing off against another soccer powerhouse. We're talking about the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. That's the same team that the U.S. beat in the last World Cup final. NBC's Molly Hunter is in New Zealand for us with some, some faithful fans, shall we say. Hey, Molly. Hey good morning from Wellington, New Zealand. It's very late at night here. And, guys, I am around a group of raging American fans. They're with the American Outlaws, Savannah, Al, and Craig. They have a message. USA! 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 As temperatures dip here in Wellington, New Zealand, the U.S. women are gearing up for tonight's big game against the Netherlands, marching towards that history-making goal, a third straight World Cup title. In their first round victory against Vietnam, eight U.S. players, including six starters, made their World Cup debuts, including superstar forward 22-year-old Sophia Smith scoring two goals. Veteran co-captain Alex Morgan saying afterwards, there's clearly room to grow. I think we saw a lot of glimpses of... Um our potential, um, but I feel like we weren't always clicking on the field. We caught up with the youngest player on the American team, 18-year-old Alyssa Thompson, who saw her first World Cup minutes in the second half. This has been a dream for me since I can remember, so being here and just being on this team with a bunch of players that I've always looked up to has been so amazing. Now the U.S. team traveling to their second New Zealand city for a much-anticipated second match. This may be the windiest spot in all of Wellington, New Zealand, but what a view. You can see the entire city. You can even see that stadium where the U.S. will play the Netherlands. We run into American fans who have traveled so far and wide to cheer on their team. You said what? The winter? Underneath those players, Mitchell said he's sporting a rose leather jersey. The 20-year-old field telling reporters today she's excited for a fun second match. They have a lot of different threats. I think they're technical, um, good on set pieces, so I think um, it's going to be a tough game. Two teams are familiar. The Americans beat a Dutch 2-0 in the 17 World Cup and again at the 21 Tokyo Olympics. 2020. In dramatic penalty kicks, her young teammates, Lavelle is full of respect. We have 14 like new players to a World Cup, but I think they're 14 really, really freaking good players. Now, as I mentioned, it was late at night here in Wellington. We also just learned that U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken is in town. He met with the team. He'll be at the game tomorrow, but he's not going to be the only one at the game tomorrow. No. We love you. We love you. Wow. Okay. Wow. They need to get a little more pumped up. Man. Yeah. Molly, thank Way you. Way to go, Molly. Yeah. There's a thing that people don't realize is we're talking like what's uh, what about 1 a.m. there. That's right, 16 uh, yeah. hours ahead. It's so, crazy. Folks, Every time we've talked to her, it's crowded outside. It looks man. like so much fun. You can watch the U.S. take on the Netherlands tonight. Oh, I thought they were playing some guy named Ned. Shut up. <laughs> Telemundo and Peacock. You can tell Savannah's new. Uh, <laughs> Telemundo and Peacock, home of the Spanish language coverage of the World Cup. Coverage starting 8.30 Eastern. If USA gets past Ned, then they go on to Bob. <laughs> anyway, just ahead. It's funny even if you're not new. I know. It's a it's, fun. But we can't encourage it. No, them. please don't. It's our series Money Matters. Insurance can be expensive and confusing. So we're going to clear up the coverage you really need and help you save a few bucks. Then later, Savannah, you've got this great story about a summer camp where education meets imagination. Third hour today. I'll be right back.
Welcome back now with our series Money Matters, part of our collaboration with CNBC Select. And this morning, we're talking about all types of insurance and how to find the right coverage for you. So we brought in CNBC Select contributor, Brittany Jones Cooper. She's here to help us out. Good to have you back. Good morning, Craig. Welcome, welcome. So yeah. car insurance, in all but two states, you have to yes. have car insurance. That's New Hampshire and Virginia. Yeah. And as we know, car insurance can be it can be pretty expensive. So what should folks be doing in terms of looking for car insurance and making sure they're getting the best deal? Yeah, well, most of us don't look, like to look for car insurance because it's not fun. No. But most experts will suggest that you look for a new policy every year or even every six months. Oh, wow. So before your current policy is expired, you should go online, get some quotes, just compare prices. You may be surprised. Also, work on your credit score because people with an excellent credit score pay on average $400 less per year for hmm. full coverage than somebody with an average credit score. So you can go online, get your credit score. If it's low, you can bump it up by paying your bills on time. You can even sign up for services that let you auto pay your rent. So you're never paying it late and that like up your credit score That's for good. sure. Yeah, it's really wow. amazing. And then also consider the coverage. If you have an older car, maybe you don't need full coverage with all the bells and whistles. You wanna make sure that those premiums aren't adding up to more than the value of your actual car, mm. right? And then look for those discounts too that I really love. If you're a student driver and you have good grades, mm -hmm. maybe you have a 3.0 or higher, Higher insurance will give you a discount for that. And fun fact, did you know that if you install an anti-theft system in your car, oh, that right. can save you money. A car loan. Oh, yeah, okay. who knew? Oh. All right, oh, lots there's of money to, to be it. found. All right, Brittany, let's talk about where you live, whether it's homeowner's insurance or if you're a renter. Also, yeah. it seems like it's getting harder and harder in some places to it insure is. your home. Yeah. The first step is to know what you have, because when it's that personal property coverage, they're going to pay or reimburse you for your damaged items. Mm. So you have to know what you mm. have. So go through, make a list of your belongings and how much they cost. That will dictate how much coverage you need. But when you're looking at plans, don't assume coverage, because mm -hmm. a lot of them don't include important things like flood and earthquake coverage, which depending on where, where you live, live, you know, can be really dangerous. So you want to look Absolutely. into that. And renters know that the insurance isn't paying to um, protect the house, but you're paying to protect your stuff. Yes. So again, so make important. a list of your possessions and get that coverage. Also know that sometimes fire and theft isn't included. Mm. So you should look for that Ooh, as well. To check it out. Um, and if you're looking to save money, bundle. Mm. If you put your life insurance and your homeowner's insurance together, sometimes you can save a little money. There you go. Great tips. All right, Brittany, uh, travel now is through the roof. Oof. What? Yeah, you, mm -hmm. When you're booking your flights and your hotels and there's usually that little check box yeah. about travel insurance, do we need travel insurance? You know, this is a very debated, hot debated issue. I mean, I talked to our editors and producers. The consensus mm -hmm. in, is in this post-pandemic era, you should look into it. There's options. A lot of airlines will offer a refundable ticket. This costs more, sometimes a lot more, mm -hmm. but if you're looking for flexibility, it could be what you need. You can also get travel insurance. That will cost four to 10% of your total travel costs. So my suggestion is weigh that against the refundable ticket mm -hmm. and just choose whichever one is cheaper, right? And then um, get covered for the, the things that you ever, sorry, get coverage for everything that you need, right. for sure. So just look into that. And what about cruise insurance? Yeah, cruise insurance is one that I highly recommend because it's usually pretty affordable mm -hmm. and it covers everything from delays to mechanical issues. So definitely. What about if like you're, you're, you're flying to the location to get the cruise and your flight's canceled oh. and you miss the cruise? Does that insurance So that's that? where something where like the overall travel insurance would be better because mm -hmm. they're going to take four to 10% of your overall costs. Yeah, and so you also say look at your credit card because there might be absolutely. some benefits. Absolutely. A lot of them have these great travel perks, but they also have insurances and reimbursements for cancellation and delays. So check that out before you buy additional coverage. All right. One that makes people kind of laugh and think, oh, <laughs> why do I need pet insurance? But our, uh, we've got an older uh, puppy yeah. now, and I wish we had done that. This is a hot button one, too. People really disagree on this, so I'm just going to give you some things to think about. Okay. It does pay to insure your pet when they're young and healthy. Right. Because like humans, insurance companies will not cover pre-existing conditions. So if you insure your pet when they're younger, your policy mm -hmm. will ultimately cover more. But it's not going to cover everything. And remember, right you're probably only going to be reimbursed for like 80 to 90 percent kind of like your own bills. insurance exactly so you're still going to have to have money aside for those remaining costs um, if you're on the fence though consider something like an accident only policy oh. uh, we talked to CM, our CNBC select actually talked to a vet said most people actually struggle with uh, paying for those unexpected accidental mm. things and so that will give you the coverage you need without breaking the bank oh good advice oh, yeah. great thank, thank you tips. Brittany thank I you. love our I'm pet. surprised Pepper's not insured you know we didn't we weren't thinking about it you know and then because she was a 
puppy. You yeah. know what I mean? and, and literally, you know, now she's getting a little older, just like all of us. And those medical <laughs> yeah. bills are expensive. They are. They saved us a lot, for Thank sure. Thank you, Brittany Jones Cooper from CNBC. By the way, uh, for more information on all of the financial tips that she just shared with you, you can go to CNBC.com slash select. It's CNBC.com slash select. We should note that CNBC may get a commission for purchases made through links on our website. All right. Thank you. Well, just ahead, we are going to visit a summer camp where kids get to live out their mythical fantasies. But this place is about much more than just having fun. And then later in our series, Double It Up, creative products for your home that will make cleanup and organizing a breeze. We'll be right back. back with our series the upside and we got a great one that savannah's bringing us you this is an epic quest for a one-of-a-kind summer camp that is right so did you guys go to camp when you were young? yes send yeah. your kids to camp i went to camp when i was a kid day camp but nothing quite like this <laughs> i recently tapped into my inner child and hung out with some young campers who are learning important life lessons while letting their imaginations run wild Kids' imaginations are really all that they need. It's about becoming a part of the story and making stories come alive. Sword fighting, decoding secret messages, the enchantress, and scouting through the woods. Welcome to Camp Half Blood. Taking a page from Rick Reardon's book series, Percy Jackson and the Olympians, the camp is one of many literacy enrichment programs across the country, run by Plato Learning, an organization founded by Crystal Bob Semple in 2009. How did this all get started for you? I owned a, a bookstore in Brooklyn. A young reader asked whether or not Camp Half-Blood, which is the story, the fictional setting of the story, whether or not it existed. I said, y yeah. I just felt compelled to take them on a further journey, a journey that went off of the page and really came to life. And 14 years later, that journey has led to 16 camps in seven states across the U.S. Here, the campers call themselves demigods, half god, half mortals, who are fully immersed in a mythological adventure. What happens at your camps that connects them to literacy? So each week, a new story unfolds. The kids arrive at camp on a Monday and they find that for some reason the world has been turned upside down and challenge the kids through activities to figure out what's going wrong in the story and how to make it right. Through role playing, kids learn leadership skills, problem solving and teamwork, all while wielding a foam sword. This is really rooted in research, right? What you're doing here at camp. Absolutely. Literacy is not just reading and writing. It goes way beyond that. The research shows is that when kids can engage in a deep way with stories, they can move from being consumers of stories to creators of story. Learning aside, it's clear these kids are just having fun. Why do you love it? The sword fighting. <laughs> the sword fighting is a lot of fun, and you yeah. get to like meet and engage with new yeah. people. Show me with your hands. Who's been to this camp before? <laughs> and you're back because you loved it. Yes. Yeah. Has this camp changed how you experience reading? Do you see yourself in any of the stories? Yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I feel like it's given me more of an open mind to books. 
and I've also moved on to sick books. <laughs> We have parents tell us all the time that my kid wouldn't necessarily pick up a book and now I can't stop them from reading these stories and other stories over and over again. Now it was my turn to become part of the story. My role, an investigative journalist helping the demigods figure out the whereabouts of a stolen artifact, of course. So we're looking for something like this. A few minutes into our hike, a clue. Who are you? Oh, uh, I'm Potinus. I'm a philosopher. The young campers had many questions. Why were you just wandering out here in the forest? Why do you have a feather? What's in that bag of yours? You said prophecy, right? Yeah. It's backwards. It's backwards. Um, it's okay. B -W -A oh. W-A is the enchantress. Finding out how their adventure ends would have to wait. But these kids are already the heroes of their own story. Hi, people of my Okay, cute stuff, right? Uh, and they great. love this camp, all of these kids that go there. Well, the camp director, Megan Hartman, told me that the kids live by what they call a hero code at their camp, and they apply that hero code to the real world as well. It's things like leading with compassion, treating others with kindness, things we can all get behind. And listen to this, 8,000 plus kids mm -hmm. were registered in Play-Doh Learning programs this summer, and there are still some available spots that go through mid-August. Okay. So if that looks like something your kid's interested in, there you go. It was good yeah. to see you out there and involved. That's I, it. I had my foam sword. Sword. I love it. Ready to go. Savannah. I did not participate in the sword fighting. I think I would have had okay. some fair advantage. Yes, you know. That's true. Uh, all those, some of those kids look pretty tough. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, it looked intense from afar. That's so, why we made sure to let you know it's foam. They yeah, foam, foam yes. Savannah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, still ahead. Uh, we are coming clean in our series Double It Up. Some great products for the home, including the vacuum that's more than meets the eye. Ooh. And then a little bit later, some summer vacation spots that you may have never even heard of. Waterfronts, mountains, and more. And it's not too late to get a last minute deal on some of these spots when the third hour of today comes right back. This week in our series, Double It Up, we've learned about multitasking products that could help make our lives easier. This morning, we're going to tackle the home with items to help us get clean and organized. Here to show us is Lauren Iannotti, the editor-in-chief of Real Simple. Good to see you, Lauren. Good to see you, Al. Thank Welcome you so much back. for having all me. Right. Thanks, guys. Well, well, first of all, you've got a great item to help our kids clean up right. after you they're wanna, playing. You want to empower them to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. So this is a combination. So all of our products here do multiple things, right? right? And we love a multitasker at Real Simple. That's our thing. Very much making your life easier but more delightful. This is a play mat and a storage bin. I don't know if you've ever, have you ever stepped on a Lego? Oh my oh, gosh. Oh, yes. right? A Lego or a Barbie heel. Ex excruciating, yeah, right? Ex it's like a puncture wound, right? Yes. So this is how we're going to uh, help you fix that, right? So you can get all the Lego splayed out, which you need to, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to want to find that exact piece right. that you need. So they can play on this. They can really play on this, and they can really get down on it. And then when it's time to clean up, and you're going to teach them to do this, mm -hmm. just grab this, grab this, huh. pull it all in. Maybe one slides, you're going to get it. Get it all in there. Boop, you're up. And it's, oh, and wow. it's a storage unit. And it's a storage right, unit, awesome. and it's cute. 
and you got it all together. That's actually really good. That's brilliant. Right? And it's wow. that's $59.99 really good idea. from uh, a company called Creative QT. <laughs> now, you we said this, this is the ultimate multitasking furniture piece? Yes, I love awesome. this. I want this. So this is um, from a company called Cozy, C-O-Z-E-Y. It is the Stella coffee table. So it looks like a coffee table right. with storage, totally. which I love. You know, everything should have storage. I feel like I don't want to buy furniture that doesn't have some kind of hidden storage these mm -hmm. days. But this is a coffee table that also has these risers. So oh, you wow. make them. Oh, it's a TV it tray. turns into a TV tray. It could be your laptop stand. Wow. I'm going to use it. You guys remember my little dog, Rusty. Yes. I'm going to use it so Rusty can't get the snacks during the movie. Look at that. He can't reach the go. popcorn. That it's too high for cool. him. That is very cool. How do it know? How know. do it know? <laughs> I love when you say that. Cozy.com. C-O-Z-E-Y.com. It's It uh, starts at 180. They're modular. You can get them different configurations huh. for whatever your space is. Love Great that. for small space living. Great for any space living because it really maximizes, mm -hmm. and that's what we love. I love this. If you don't have enough counter space, for your makeup bag, all your tools, show us what this is. Look at how this, how cool this is. It's a silicone sink topper. It's really flexible. You put it yeah. on top of your sink. So if you have a pedestal sink, mm -hmm. or maybe you just, maybe you have a vanity, but it's not a lot of space. Right. This expands the space. Mm -hmm. It's heat resistant, so you can put your heat tools right on there. I keep it away th from the uh, faucet, though. You just might want to keep it away from the faucet. Okay. That's a good, a good little bit of advice. We're gonna just rotate <laughs> that for you. But also, you take it out, and you can actually wash your makeup brushes on this. You just oh. do one of these guys, rinse them off. What? So you're gonna That's wash cool. your makeup makeup brushes more now that oh. you have this thing. Yeah. Um, this is on Amazon.com dot com and it's 28 bucks. So Lauren, tell, tell, tell us about this broom. Oh, I'm standing okay. in front. Okay, this is not just a broom. It slices, it dice. No, it doesn't slice <laughs> or dice. But That's the does, ultimate multitask. It does do a lot. So it's a broom and a vacuum hybrid what? from a company called uh, Clean Sweep. And it's going to basically, uh, you're going to just kind of like, if you get a little a little spill like this and mm -hmm. someone's going to go tracking it through the house, before, the, before you can get to the vacuum, right. you grab this thing and it's going to sweep it right up for you. Whoa. Yeah, what? it's going to take that right up for you. What? I mean, listen, is it like the most necessary thing in the world? I mean, we, we've, we've managed to this point with a dustpan. And you I know, know this, but I was going to say, it a little bit easier. if it came with a dustpan, it would probably it will, work it, a little yeah. faster. It's in there. It's in there. You take it out and pop it into the trash. It's, gotcha. a, it's a cool, like, it's a cool kind of oh, little upgrade for you if you're it, into it. But that's it. cool. Yep. <laughs> and then um, I love this. What so, is this? Yeah, what's this, going on here? <laughs> this is a planter with a hidden uh, cat litter thing underneath it. I know. I I know, but wait, 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 it's, hidden what? it's on Chewy.com, kitty litter. <laughs> and, oh, and you know what? This is our green room cat. <laughs> this cat lives in our green I know, room. Wait a it's adorable. Wait a minute. Not now, the friendliest, now, though. Now, Lauren, Not the friendliest. Lauren, what? Like, who needs okay, this? Yeah, no, no, no. This is really more. useful because, okay. It's, <laughs> no, no, no. Really. <laughs> really useful. It's Come like, on, Lauren. It doesn't Good. really say. So it's it's green decor. It like, gives you nice some nice cream. Also, you know, if you have pets, you know that like plants can be. He's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> what the, what That's is not wrong supposed with to happen. You? That doesn't happen in rehearsal. No, get, the vacuum, get the vacuum broom. I know. No, no cats were hurt <laughs> in, the, in the making of this spot. Good God. Well, where's the cat? Where's the cat? Oh, here's the cat. <laughs> She's okay, everyone. Fluffy. It's fine. It's Fluffy. all fine. It's on Chewy.com. The beauty of this, if you use it right. I'll just come over. Whoa! Here. If you use it right, I'll just we'll... stand still, please. If you use it right, it Here we keeps go. your kitty litter hidden. We'll use um, all it's, of our It's, a, it's a great little hidden situation, but it's also, you know, pets can be allergic to plants. So this means, or they can be uh, poisoned by plants. So I apologize. It keeps your pets safe. So, so, oh, look, there's this a dustbin. Really off the rails. <laughs> apologize for my Lauren, friend. Chewy.com. This is very nice. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. So sorry. <laughs> What's coming uh, up, Al? Coming up, uh, talking about, we're going to talk about real plants. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing good will go and wrong no there. No one's spilling Tomorrow, anything. guess what? Tomorrow's take your plant for a walk day. We're going <laughs> to oh, find out go. how to safely move indoor plants outside. But first, vacations calling from relaxing water plants to mountain escapes and more. Lauren needs one now. Uh, <laughs> it's not too late to book a trip <laughs> and get a great deal. Sorry, Third Lauren. hour of today, we'll be right I back. I love real So sorry. I was just curious as to what was underneath. You know, you're sorry. Poor Fluffy.
All right, so we're flying by, folks. And if you haven't made those travel plans just yet, or maybe you want to squeeze in another vacation, there is still time to book mm -hmm. and find a deal. So here to help us do it, Mark Elwood, travel expert, uh, aficionado. Yes. Thank you so much for coming hey, Mark. in. You're welcome. Nice so to see you. Let's start with this picturesque waterfront destination in, in the Midwest. This is an mm -hmm. all-American summer. I think I used to live in Chicago, and I think people forget that those towns on the coast of Lake Michigan are like flowers that bloom in the summer. Ooh, and I'm going to wow, send you to Kenosha. That. Do you like that? Like yes. I think, I'm going to send you to Kenosha, cool. Wisconsin, just south of Milwaukee. Five gorgeous beaches right on the ocean, Ooh. right on the lake incredible summer fest real classic american mm. summer there's a sweet corn festival there's a county fair you're getting what you dream of when you think americana and there's a great hotel the stella old colonnaded building oh, grand cool. hotel downtown very affordable everything we're talking about under 200 bucks a night oh, nice. oh that's good goodness. to know that's okay great all right what about now we're heading to the mountains right a historic picturesque inn i'm going to bring you a little closer to us i'm going to bring you to new hampshire okay and this that's is about think, i mean look at this remember mm. this is one of my big tips those winter destinations that you associate with skiing right. are gorgeous in the summer Mm. That countryside bursts into life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got hiking, you've got yeah. zip lining. And of course, I mean, look at this. That's, That's beautiful. Look at this hotel, right? Wow. And the Wentworth was just redone. It just relaunched. Multi, multi million dollar renovation. But you've got Mount Washington there, lovely Cog Railway, a classic Storyland, a lovely mm. amusement park there. Again, more all American. Park. More expensive? Love no, all, all we, we, we're talking about, these all started under 200 bucks. That's wow. amazing. That hotel is gorgeous. That's right. So let's go head down to the Big Easy. You've got a really unique hotel that, that we've been praying to get to. <laughs> Touche, I love you. <laughs> Tee that up. This is an old Catholic this church so and cool. school. It's so, have you been? Yes. It's, yes. what would you, it's so funky, it's right? It's so funky. And all the, these spaces, it's like so much fun to take pictures in, everything. The food was good too. Oh, was it? Yeah. In, I mean, yeah. it's Instagram friendly. Oh, wow, this is. And look, I mean, this is an old church that has been turned into a really cool hotel. Huh? But you're going to New Orleans in August because it's culinary New Orleans, mm. which is basically their restaurant month. Mm -hmm. Where else would you want to go to have restaurant month than New Orleans? As you say, the food is spectacular and if you're staying at a hotel like that for under 200 bucks that's amazing I mean, yeah really cool is, wow. hotel peter yeah. and paul we've done uh, new hampshire wisconsin we've done new orleans let's go out west now you've got this uh, rustic spot in california that also has a taste of modern flair mm -hmm. we're going to go to sierra nevada resort which is pet friendly but i feel like we shouldn't even talk about pets now oh, yeah. very pet friendly oh, oh, your cats soon. might Too be soon. safer here than in the I'm going to send you to this. It's a real rustic luxe resort. Been there for about five decades. Classic Americana. And again, remember, Mammoth Lakes, another ski destination in the summer. Right. Those hundred lakes, you're kayaking on them. You're hiking to Crystal Lake. You're biking 80 miles of tracks. Oh, gosh, is it gorgeous. Wow. Mm. All right. Bring it back here again. Atlantic City. Oh. Family friendly, yep. though. Okay. You see? Uh, yeah, I mean, I love this. Huh. You see, I think New York is like, hmm. <laughs> are you water park people? <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, but okay. I don't have kids. I, am. I don't have kids. I, I don't, don't either. I don't a lot either. of people are. Yes, exactly. they are. Eleven, this is what it claims to be the world's largest indoor water park. It just opened this month. That's a huge water park. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Again, there's also cool. the ocean. There we go. There's, there's also oh, the oh. ocean. It's got a it's got everything you could want in a water park. And then we've got this great hotel, the Showboat, which has it's really family friendly, very affordable. Got an indoor amusement arcade, sixty thousand square feet. Your kids will have something to do. Wow. from morning to night. My kids would love that. So you want to, you, maybe you want to do the Caribbean. We always think that's going to cost a boatload of money, but you've got something great for us. It's not going to so cost cool. a boatload of money off season because, of course, we think of the Caribbean in the winter. We think, sure. oh, January, February. You're going to get great weather, maybe a little rain in the afternoon, but you're having a nap after lunch anyway. Sure. What time? What month? Uh, right now? Right now. Okay. Right now. It's July, August, and I'm going to send you to St. Lucia. Oh, I love St. Lucia. Oh. I thought you loved St. Lucia. Yes. Why do you love St. Lucia? Uh, when we went last time, we stayed this wonderful place between nestled between these two mountains mm -hmm, the pitons yes yes and it has that wonderful overlay french english caribbean a really unique culture and also you've got the mud baths there so you cover yourself we in did the, the did mud you, bath 
that did they did it did it knock years off you? It's supposed to knock a decade off I you. I did not work. Look at that skin. It knocked oh. some years off my, my did, wife. Did you find mud where you didn't want it? <laughs> oh, that's okay. Actually, I did. But I'm going to send you to the, a great resort here, the Tikai, which is an adults-only one on a beautiful oh. beach. I mean, oh. it's just snorkel-friendly. You name it. Oh, Look at this wow. You had me at adults-only. <laughs> yeah. I mean, got a funicular going up the mountain. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, oh, Mark. Gorgeous. You're welcome. Thank you. That was so much fun. Always good to see you. Well, coming up in Wellness Wednesday, we are taking a trip with our plants. You heard that right. How to move indoor plants outdoors for the summer. Hilton! Important stuff. There we go. We'll be right back. Hilton's oh, moving. No, He's come moving back. Right now. Come back. <laughs> He's moving it down. with our Wellness Wednesday series, and you might be asking yourself, why the heck are they holding plants? Why are we holding plants? Well, we're going to go for a stroll in the studio. All right, Mr. here we go. Let's do it. <laughs> so Come tomorrow on, is National Take Your House Plant for a Walk Day. So, so we yeah. are walking with a plant stylist and author of Living Wild, Mr. Hilton Carter. We love him here on the show. He's going to show us how to move our indoor plants outside for the summer. Hilton, this is good great. to see you. This hey, it's good to be back. Thanks for having me. We're walking, we're walking, you're walking. Now you're going to place your plants right over here because they need okay. to be on those base trays. All okay. right. Now we're talking about national take your plants for a walk day. It's important that you understand that all plants, all living things want an opportunity to go back outside to feel nature, mm -hmm. breathe the air, and plants love the outdoor element. We're just forcing them inside. So we have the opportunity to take them back outside. It's a good way to get them to grow, to shine. So it's not too late to do this. It's not too late. It's always a good time to put them back outside. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing you want to be aware of is you got to do it slowly. You can't just force them back out into the sun. They've been in your ah. darker homes, maybe, mm -hmm. and you want to slowly acclimate them outside. And you want to make sure that you're always protecting them when it comes to like moisture and how much moisture you're giving them. So you want to water them when they need water. Mm -hmm. We have some moisture meters over here that can get, mm -hmm. get a, a bit of a gauge on if they need oh. that moisture because they're going to get uh -huh. watered by obviously nature itself. But right. sometimes there could be a downspin where they're not getting water. So you want to make sure that you are watering them as well just to make sure they're getting everything they I've need. I've never used one of these moisture meters. Moisture That's meters cool. are great, especially if you have plants like obviously your main hair fern here, plants mm -hmm. that need a lot of moisture. Yeah. Yes, the humidity of outdoors are going to help them but you're probably going to have to water them yourself as well. What's the benefit of this for your plants? Plants love being outdoors. So much more light, so much more humidity, and that is the thing that's going to make them grow. So when you're talking about growing, the one thing that you want to do is also make sure you're repotting your plants. Okay. Spring, summer, so it's called grow season. You move them out, you have to repot. You don't have to move, you don't have to repot them when you move them outside, mm -hmm. but this is the perfect opportunity because it is spring, summer, or this mm -hmm. summer, you want to make sure that you are repotting them when they need to be repotted. And the easiest way to do that is obviously you have them in your nursery pot, just give it a good squeeze, it should come out. Uh -huh. That's really easy. Yeah. Uh, then you break it up a little bit over the pot, yeah. let those roots shine. You might want to stick some of your fresh organic soil in there as right. well, you can do that. Hilton, how, how do you how do folks know when it's time to repot? repot it's plant? always a key sign when you start to see your roots coming oh. out of the oh. drainage hole. Mm -hmm. Now, plants like this ficus lorata, they like their roots to be a little bit compact in there, so they don't need to be repotted once they have a bunch of roots there. But once you start to see the roots coming out of the drainage hole, clear sign they need to have a new pot. Hilton, do you, can you? Put them just like in your garden. I mean, do you have to put them, keep them in a pot? Mm. You can put them in your. You can add them to your garden if you.
you have the right climate. Ah. I would suggest if you're going to take them from uh, indoors to outdoors, always leave them in the planters that you had them in mm. so they can easily acclimate once co coming outside. Should we fertilize right after we repot? You don't have to fertilize right when you repot. Mm -hmm. Adding fresh soil is the process of, re of, of, of fertilizing. Uh -huh. That soil has good stuff in it already, so you should be good there. But during the season, right, spring, summer, that's when you want to fertilize all your plants to keep, keep them healthy and growing. Now, once you have them outside, you want to do that routine maintenance. Oh, and then when, we reverse it and bring them back in. And then you reverse it and bring them back in later. But when you do the routine maintenance, you want to make sure that obviously the elements, wind, things of that nature, things that can help weigh down your pots in, the, in your home, unless you have oh. kids who like pushing plants over like I do, you <laughs> might want to weigh them down uh, yeah. with some stones. Uh, there's issues when it comes to just like how wild they might grow. Because you sure. might have a small plant like this Good. when you first put it outside, right. but once it comes back in later, it could be this big. Oh, wow. so you, with one of mine <laughs> exactly. So you might need to prune it back a bit, maybe remove some of those dead leaves. Mm -hmm. And you can also, if you have issues when they're not being, oh, I guess they're uh, kind of being unruly right. and branches are going yeah. this way. They're not right. standing upright. Exactly. You can use stakes to kind of tie them back or hold them in, which you can see down here, oh. which is holding your leaves and your foliage more upright, especially when you have these bigger vinier plants mm -hmm. that want to hang out. And Velcro? And Velcro, gardening Velcro. You tie that to wow. the stake to the branch to the leaf and that's how you do that's it. Amazing. Now when it comes to bringing them back in because that's going to be a big issue. Yeah. Right. right. And what about bugs? There's going to be some cre cre creepy crawlers that oh. are going to get into your soil. You're going to want to make sure before you bring them back in that you wash your plants off, spray them down deeply mm -hmm. and you're going to take the whole planter, fill up like a bucket of water, place it in that water, let it sit in that oh, water for wow. about 10 minutes. All those critters are going to crawl their way out because oh. they don't oh, want to drown. Exactly. Oh. You want to do that before you bring them back in. And the same process of acclimating them, slowly bringing them outside, uh -huh. you're going to do that when you bring them back in because they had all that light. You're going to slowly bring them back in and let them get the light that they need and then they should be you fine. You make plants so much fun. Thank hey, you. Man. And and it's it's awesome. Awesome. So hey, man. Third hour today will be right Thank back. Thank you, Hilton. Of course. Savannah, you're back tomorrow and you picked a good day because we're having a summer block party on the plaza. I know, it's going to be so much fun. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, the celebrity photographer has become a rising star at just 10 years old. Can't wait to see how that develops. We'll see you tomorrow. who can get the biggest stars to strike a pose. We'll meet 10-year-old Miles Minishata. Plus, the women behind the Feel Good podcast, I've had it, Jennifer Welch and Angie Pumps Sullivan. And Bethany Frankel opening up about marriage and if a wedding is in her future. We're talking about it. It's, okay. it's today with Hoda 
and Jenna. It all starts right now. Hey guys, how are you? It is Wednesday, it is the 26th day of July. Happy you're here. Happy, okay. happy you're here. Happy you're here. No, I'm quite happy that you're here. <laughs> How are you? How are you? What's going on? Did you have a good evening? Yes, I did. I had a nice, <laughs> nice evening. Oh, I'm happy to hear I that. Ha I'm, I have been, one thing I've been doing over and over and over and over every night is I'm trying to play my guitar so I can play Landslide. Yeah. And Every day before I go to bed, I play for just like 15 minutes. Yes. And I play usually when I wake up for 15. And I have to tell you, it reminds you that if you practice, you do get better. It I still know. doesn't sound like landslide, but it will. It's getting close. It's getting closer. It's so true. It's like what our parents said when yes. we were little is like the more you practice, the better you are. Sometimes you don't want to hear that. But it's the truth at anything in life. I've been trying to teach my kids the thing about practicing and also about not giving up. Like, you know, I remember there was a story of a little girl who was playing in a violin recital and it just was not a good recital. She was 10 or 12 or something. And her parents were like, oh my God, it was the worst recital. Oh no, 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 no. And my sister asked them, did she finish? And they said, what? Did she finish yeah. the piece? And they, she, they said, yes. She said, They'll be fine. Yeah. She'll be fine. Finish what you start. Yes. Like, that's the lesson. Yeah. You know, and I keep thinking about that. And it's such a good lesson, yeah. too, that it's never too. I think sometimes I'm like, gosh, I wish I could yeah. paint. Yes. Or I wish I could. Like your dad yeah. painted. Like we could do things. Yeah. If my dad did it in his 60s, yes. then you can do it in yes. your 40s. It's like, why not find that one? There's this author who writes about the unicorn space. Yeah. Um, Eve Rotsky. And yeah. it's all about finding that, like, really fun thing. And I, for me, it was reading, although now I'm like, I'm kind of working You're in reading. It. Right. So what is like What's the other my thing? hobby? Yes. And yours is guitar, guitar right now. It is, and it's fun. And also um, what else? cooking. You're baking a lot of cool things. That's I am. I, am. I believe you're also interested in hacks. Okay, you know what? Now you're being mean. <laughs> no, you're a hack. I'm a you're hack, hack aficionado. You're, you're a hacker. You're somebody that just loves a hack. I do love a hack. It's true. I love when well, I see okay. them. You I'm fall fascinated. in love with things, including <laughs> hacks, and that's a beautiful thing about you. All right, so our friend Bethany Frankel's opening up about her relationship. She's engaged to her fiance. She's been engaged for a couple years now. And now everybody keeps asking, well, when's the wedding date? When's yeah. the wedding date? So she decided that she's in no rush to get married. And this is what she had to say. I've been engaged for so long and obviously I can build a wedding. I've produced multi-million dollar events. Uh, I don't want to build a wedding. I yeah. love my life. I love my fiance. And uh, he's an amazing life partner. And I don't want to sign a contract with someone that I love and I don't want to do plan a massive wedding for everybody else and not what we want. It's it's interesting. Just throwing back that drink and telling the truth. That's what she does. Don't you love that she about Bethany? The By the way, truth teller. Yeah. Truth teller. She sure does. Yeah. But I, here's the thing. I like, I love the end of that statement. I don't, because you know, in life when people are like, well, what are you going to do? Or, so mm -hmm. you, now you're engaged. When are you going to get married? Mm -hmm. The easy thing is just to follow sort of the social yeah. norms yes. or yes. to get throw a wedding for yes. your parents. Or yes. your, She's like, I, I don't, don't need to. Right. So therefore, I'm other. not going to and probably like stop asking me. <laughs> and I think commitment is what you think it is. Like, I think if you are committed to your life partner yeah. as uh, you know, there are several couples who live their lives that way. Everyone talks about Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell or... Um, Enrique Iglesias and Anna Kornikova, yes. or some others that I can't recall. We were like, there's not that many, the, 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 the sort of golden the argument couple. The was, was like, there's just one, and everyone's like, see, it does work. Yeah. But actually, there are more than that. And again, like, relationships are different. Yes. You do you. Why yeah. does it, you do you. If yeah, it makes totally. you happy, do it. Wait, don't you think it's kind of weird in our society, and I, I do it too. I mean, and obviously, if somebody gets engaged, the question is going to be when you get married. But, like, why are we rushing everybody to do everything? We're I remember rushing. being in high school and people being like, well, where are you going to go to college? So like where, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? And then in college, so what are you going to do for your job? Right. What are you going to do? And when you get when you get engaged, when are you going to get married? Yeah. When are you going to have kids? Yeah. When are you going to do this? Yes. When are you going to do that? And it happens professionally too. You write a book. When's your next book? Yes. My next book? Yes. I just I, I just, just finished. So what's next on what's your plate? What's next? You're what's like what's next on your plate? What's like, next? By the way, I might ask that question of every celebrity at the end of the interview. So what do you have next? Yeah. 
That's crazy. I know. But we do it with everything. We're already talking about back to school sales and it's July. I know. Like we already had the Rockettes on I know. because it's six months till Christmas or whatever it is. We're but celebrating I think the Olympics because it's a year, year away. Out. I think that's how we think. It's like I like things to look forward to. Me too. But I think we have to learn like not to rush but things. But also like rushing our kids. Yes. You know, to worry about what the that. next thing is. Yes. As opposed to just like Be being here. here, enjoying high school, not I mean, worried about what the next step is. And I, everybody does it because it's a societal norm. Yeah, so, I think it I is. I don't know, Bethany Frankel, how you brought us there, well, but, th but we thank appreciate you. it. And we wish you well. We appreciate okay, it. Okay, Dolly Parton is going to rock, man. You know, she's got this, she's got new music. Yes. And there's uh, her latest music release. And this is something that Dolly is doing with NBC for the Olympics. Isn't it is amazing? a song. It's okay. a cover. And she, you know, she has that collaboration, right? She has this whole new cover of special rock songs. So the first one is We Are the Champions. Dolly and the Olympics. That got me excited Nothing. for everything. How about her gold, silver, and bronze Only dresses? Do do Dolly video. could wear the gold, silver, and bronze so well. Gosh, she's amazing. She's amazing. Okay. What's your favorite cover? Do you have a, well, minus the new Indigo Girls, which we would continue to play, the Brandy Carlisle. I've played that nonstop. I sent it to everyone. I can't stop playing How did it. the men of the eight feel about you constantly playing it today? I think the only people, woman. I walk into the studio early in the morning playing my music because I like it. It, makes, it soothes are. me. Yeah. And they're like, what is that? Sometimes they're polite and sometimes they're like, okay. How did the men feel when you I don't know. They, I think to bang it yeah, on? I think their ears were bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like that kind of music. I love it. What me do you, too. What's your... Uh, well, I have, I have this cover I'm really into. Mm. Um, that is, it is Imagine Dragons oh, singing blank, blank space. What? By Taylor Swift. Is this the tiny, what is that place? I don't oh. know where they're hanging out, but. Let's tell you I'm insane. But I've got blank space, space, baby. baby. Don't you like it? And I don't like it. Man. I love that. What's your favorite? Mine, cover? of course, how could it be anything but this? Luke Combs singing mm -hmm. Fast Car is insane. Driving, driving in your car, speed so fast, felt like I was drunk. City lights, they all before us, but your arms felt nice right around my shoulders. By the way, I think I saw Tracy Chapman on Instagram yes. saying, wouldn't a collaboration be great? Yes, she did. Tracy, the great Tracy Chapman. By the way, I love that song. I love Tracy Chapman, and that cover only makes me love it more. Yeah, yeah. We want, that'd be a great collaboration. Coming up next. Jen and I are going to taste test some buzzy food trends. Yeah, we're going to decide if they're yuck or yum after this. It is that time, isn't it? It sure is. It's the time <laughs> when our producers have to watch us try out some unique food combos and snacks in a segment we like to call Yuck or, or yum. yum. So our culinary producer, Katie Steele, is here to help us out. Hi, Katie. Katie.
Katie, are these more yuck or more yum? I mean, it depends what you think. I think Jenna might like a few of them. Oh, honestly. okay. That so means they're, they're, they're the kind cheese of, department. Yes. Exactly. Okay. okay. So let's get your paddles. paddles. We'll get ready. Okay. The first one, it comes to us from Neil Patrick Harris. Oh. So he said to New York Mag that this is something that he ate. It is an almond butter, strawberry jelly, Dorito English muffin. Oh my okay. word. This is he not said, something I was expecting, but me either. I'm, I'm kind of into this selfishly. You but kind of are? Yeah. You I are. love a Dorito. Did you have a taste of it? No. I left it for you guys. <laughs> Neil claims that it adds a new mommy crunch, and he says that the Doritos help balance out the almond butter and the jelly. What do we think? Mm. Is this a yuck? Or is this a yuck? Oh, that's a way yuck. more than I thought. Oh, yuck. okay. That's a yuck. Miles gave us a thumbs up, too. Miles is into mm. it. Okay. Mm. That's I'm good. Surprised. Moving on to our next one. You might have seen this on the internet. This is the viral. <laughs> Why is it white right here? Because it's processed cheese and sometimes the color is a little, we're not going to get into that. But anyways, Burger King Thailand uh, came up with this. It is their well. real <laughs> cheeseburger. There's no burger involved in this. It's literally 20 slices of cheese. I think I might get sick. Yeah. Amongst um, them, I honestly, I love all cheese. You couldn't bite that no. if you I, I, Yeah. Oh, you're gonna have to. Gonna have to. Someone have to. has to. I'm not to. gonna yeah. use the restroom for seven weeks. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's just like eating I American mean, cheese. I mean, slices. I love cheese too, but this it takes too it too much? far. Okay. Burger King did get good feedback, and they said that they're going to release a real meat burger in the next week. So we'll have to yeah, try that. Yeah, we're gonna do that together. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Sorry, wow. Burger King. Real meat burger. Oh, we don't know. Wow, what it's just hitting me. It's what? really, really. That cheese. <laughs> That's really hard. As a <laughs> child, I might have liked that. It's just a lot. Okay, it's well, just a lot. Maybe you'll like this is a little palate cleanser. This is the TikTok phenomenon of crispy freeze-dried candies. So here we have Wait, what? Skittles. Wait, Hi, no, 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 How back up. What are you talking about? <laughs> People are buying these dehydrators and then putting their favorite candies in there and they're taking out the winter candy. and so then they're which blowing is what? up. Show us which is what. So this is the caramel apple pops. Mm. These are peach rings. These are high chews and these are Skittles. I had Skittles last week. It's, Skittles. I think the Skittles are so delicious because I don't really like the crunch of it, like the chew of a Skittle, but I like like the tartness. Mm. Oh, like I think that's pretty good. Yeah, that'd be my that'd be yum for me. I'm what curious is, to see like how the peach ring. An, one? And this yeah. is an apple. Pop. This is a caramel apple lollipop. What do you mean a caramel apple lollipop? I don't even know what that is. Like a like a tootsie pop. pop. It's really sweet. Wow. Oh. Whoa. Oh yeah. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. Sorry, no. A Skittle is the perfect size. Wait, we're going to try Go for it. Wait, we yuck or yum? Um, yuck yuck for yum. some of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yum, yum oh. for the Skittles. This tastes like medicine. Medicine? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. <laughs> Coming up next, a 10-year-old who is a photography star in the making. We are going to meet Miles Minashata, and we're going to get to see some of the photos he snapped of us. He's pretty talented. We're going to talk with him. Behind the this. scenes. Oh, yeah, Miles. Let's go, Miles. <laughs> Okay, as parents, we're always telling our children that they can do anything they set their minds to, and you are about to meet a kid who's taking that advice. Yeah, bring your kids into the room, because he's a 10-year-old self-taught photographer from Maryland. Take a look at how he's turned his passion for photography into a very cool career. Meet Miles Mini Shada. Don't let his small stature fool you. There's a reason this kid calls himself the world's youngest professional photographer. Miles picked up his first camera at age two, and at six years old, he landed a job photographing New York Fashion Week. 
Today, you can find Miles telling celebrities like Sweetie, Nikki Hilton, and Yara Shahidi to strike a pose. While he loves being behind the lens at big events, he particularly enjoys photographing the world around him. A rising star making a name for himself in a profession filled with grown-ups. So wow. Miles and his mom high-fiving Shay Moore. They're here with us this morning. Welcome. Uh, hi Miles. guys. Hi. Miles, <laughs> two years old, and you picked up a camera. What was it that drew you to photography? You drew me to photography. <laughs> she did? How did your I, mom? I used to be a model. She used to be the photographer. Oh. Every time, I kept, I kept taking the camera from her. Oh. And then at two, I was starting to like learn the camera. I'm like, what is this? And then at three, I was like, learn this, like really trying to shoot. It shows you that what our parents do, we model, right, Shay? I mean, yes. he, he must have seen something in you yeah. that he wanted to, to be. Yes, I um I had him with me all the time at photo shoots and then like he said he was a model so I was taking pictures of him and he would just grab the camera and I'm like what are you doing this is expensive put it down yeah be careful you know what's, exactly you know what's so interesting because a lot of kids could have grabbed the camera and just shot crazy stuff but there's something special about you Miles you have an eye so when you look through the mm -hmm. lens the viewfinder what are you looking for how do you know when it's time to click the button. When they're in the right pose yeah. and lighting, there's also this feature in the camera. It's like a little, like square usually. It's usually a square, and they go like, <laughs> like that's how I know. I'm that's usually, how you know. Like usually, I just, I just, like I don't press it, like but I press it like. You kind of click it, but like you also take nature. You look yeah. at nature and you see something that catches your eye. What are you looking for? Nature is my most amazing thing. There's just so many, so much stuff out here that's amazing. And I'm looking for all, all of that stuff. And some, some of the people on there might have saw the car picture I took that was actually in my backyard. Yeah, oh, it's just something. You know you what's saw. so funny, um, Shay, is that I feel like kids see the beauty and, and he definitely does. Mm -hmm. And objects that sometimes adults don't even pay attention to. Yeah, we walk to. right past them. Yes, does absolutely. he inspire yeah. you? Do his photographers, <laughs> his photographs inspire you? They do. Um, they make me look at the world differently. Um, there are a couple shots where so sometimes he'll say, I'll go in the backyard. And I look at the pictures that he took and I say, where is that? Where is that? <laughs> right. Because I've never seen it in the backyard. And I just, you know, I don't see what he sees. A lot of times I used to say, let me make sure you got the shot. Let me see what you captured. Yeah. And I'm like, never mind, you yeah. got it. By the way, you have not been, like, some moms are stage moms. You just let your son, we've yeah. been watching you today. Yeah. He does his thing, and you're just there as, just to help him out. And, Miles, you took some pictures of us today. You were very, you were behind the scenes. You came in our secret meeting. Wow. Oh, we love look that. At, look at you. Can we frame that one? Oh, that's my oh, croissant. That she you got me it. in my happy place. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, you, that's a beautiful how do you, picture of How Huda. did you even know what you were doing? You took that one? Mm -hmm. Miles. Um, we have a guy here named Photonate who's starting to feel uncomfortable. Uh, Photonate <laughs> takes all of our pictures. Photo! Photo oh, he just, wait, he Photonate, just wait, hold on. Photonate just put his cameras down Photonate and Photonate just away. put his cameras down. Oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> Don't worry, Photonate. Photonate, he's got talent, right? So much of it. He's a so much talent. That's from a pro who's been shooting here for a long time. Well, we're proud of you, Miles. How long has he been shooting for? He's been. Sh how long have you been shooting for, Photo Nate? Seven, seven years. years. We've been shooting for the same seven years on this show. He just said we've been shooting for the same amount of time because he started. <laughs> <laughs> he, he said he better hurry up. Uh, oh my God! Great job and great being. What a what a mom you are, Shay. Know, wow, you're an incredible amazing. mother. Coming up next, guys, we've got uh, a designer. One's a lawyer, and together they're known as Jen, Jen and Pops. Pops. Okay, they're the ladies behind the funny hit podcast, I've Had It, and we're going to meet them right after this.
Okay, whether you are a true crime junkie, obsessed with a TV show, or you just want to laugh, we've got the perfect podcast for you. Yeah, so today we're kicking off a brand new series to let you in on some of the best podcasts you may be missing, and we're calling it Hoda and Jenna's Hot Pods. Okay, our inaugural very first uh, pod comes to us from two best friends in Oklahoma who have one thing to say. I've had it! Let me tell you what I've had it with. Okay. Non-graduation graduations. It's the worst. Jennifer Welch and Angie Sullivan, better known as Jen and Pumps, have turned their long friendship of rigorous honesty into one of the hottest podcasts around. We would like to welcome you to I've Had It, a podcast about positivity <laughs> and petty grievances <laughs> and sharing light. Episode after episode <laughs> of unmitigated rage. <laughs> After Pumps, a lawyer in Oklahoma, hired Jen, an interior designer almost 30 years ago, they immediately became an inseparable and entertaining duo. And when it comes to you, I'm incredibly nosy. Codependent. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> that too. And you, me. Their teenage kids suggested they turn their constant phone calls venting about life into a podcast. And so they launched I've Had It this past October. In less than a year, the show has hit the top of the podcast charts, made headlines with celebrity guests like Kelly Osbourne and the Pioneer Woman. The phrase that gets me, 10 years ago, I married my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> I have had it. And captured the attention of countless fans like, I'm sorry, Rihanna, and announced a multi-city tour with a special stop right here for us. Wow! Okay, Y'all, thank you for being here. Y'all have blown you up. You, yes. blo you blew up before Hot Pods. Yeah. Y'all were big, 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 Seriously, big. you've been on fire, and it yeah. all started just with an organic friendship. Yeah. Yes. Talk about how, how y'all met. I heard there was some ro slight roasting. Well, she, I hired her to do my house, and she walks in, and I said, I'm a terrible decorator. You just do what you want. I just, I don't have yeah. to taste, whatever. Do it, do it. And she said, well, I'll I know why you have bad taste. You have silk flowers on your table <laughs> oh, and a welcome. picture of silk, silk flowers on your wall. That's the worst. And I mean, <laughs> I had fell head over heels in love immediately. I was like, that is the best. I mean, for this to take off, it's more like you guys had phone calls and your kids said, why don't you make a podcast? Right. There are a million people who have been told you should have a podcast, but yours took off and got all this traction. How did you know that something was hitting? Well, I think that right now in the yeah. Instagram world, everybody has filters on them. Yeah. It's yeah. all these inspirational yeah, yeah, yeah. quotes. Yeah. Nobody has time for that. Yes. It's not sustainable. <laughs> it's so much more fun to trash talk. Right. It's so much more therapeutic. We all know it. Right. So let's just own it and do some, you know, high right. quality trash talking. Y'all are also just hitting things that are so, like, I, yes. the, we just had that one example of the graduation for, like, uh, first wow. graders. Yeah, first what graders. That That's about? not even a big year. It's like, it's how insane. can you not graduate from preschool? Like, doesn't everyone? Yeah, <laughs> we're celebrating the lowest bar thing. Preschool graduation. It's it has to end what because else? these kids are going to be monsters. What else have you um, <laughs> What else have you had it with oh recently? Gosh. Um, TSA. We've always oh, had it with TSA. And what's the issue there? Everything. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. On our flight here to New York yesterday, I had it with you. We're on a plane. <laughs> Our flight's delayed, and the lady comes on, and she's doing an announcement about a repair they're doing on the plane, and this woman sticks her hand up oh, in no, the air yes, on did. the airplane, and I'm like. We have a brand. She said it was a good question. You were oh, a total Karen. <laughs> I know. I was. I was. She was a total what was the question? Where were you? She was like, so if the flight gets canceled, are you going to rebook us? Which, one thing I've okay. had it with are stupid questions. <laughs> 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 Like a different plane, or if we had to. It was a complete. You know what? She was just okay. wondering if she could make it to the <laughs> Today right. Show. Okay. Like, what if we don't get there? And I was like, Oh, we'll get there. Oh, we'll, we'll get, get there. there. Ask her questions. <laughs> okay. There's a game y'all like to play. Yeah. Yes. yes. We're gonna play it. Okay. 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 Tell us what it is. Okay. It's called Had It or Hit It. Okay. So we're gonna list something. You, if you've had it with it, or if you really love, love it, it, you'd hit it. We want to hear y'all's comments too, because you're funnier. Yeah. People with separate Instagram accounts for their pets. Had it or hit it? Hit it. You, you like it? Oh, and you miss. I've had it. I've had I, it. Listen, I love my cat Holly so much. I like to talk about her in all my spare time. I like to show strangers her picture. Right. But I want to protect her privacy. <laughs> <laughs> I am not going to 
put her out there for any old creep. To have you ever, any old creep, have you ever looked at someone's uh, puppy, like Insta? No, do you like their puppy? Hit it. I'm, I'm totally in. Thank I'm you. Not. I like you animals. Think you you like animals and you all don't? Okay. No, I like right. animals. Okay, what's I don't the need next to put one? them on next. Insta. <laughs> okay, okay, next. Next. Protect your son. Next. Had it, I, well, my dogs are my biological <laughs> children, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Had it or hit it, voice memos. I love a voice memo. Really? Hit. Hit, 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 we hit, love hit, it. hit. You know why? Because one time, one time. <laughs> Twice. Just, tw well, okay, once for me, bragging. once for you. Oprah left us a thing. No, so we saved it. Yes. And now we have no, it for And now eternity. we have it. And it's not a voicemail that you might delete. Continue. Okay, okay, right, not yeah, that we're showing you. Okay, one more. One more. Had it or hit it, neighborhood Facebook groups. Had it. Had it. It's oh, just nosy people. The worst. No, and you know what else we've had it with? Those text chains with all the moms. Uh, no, the thank you. How do you get off? The, the power moms are the worst. worst. You know, so this is a What's huge wrong with problem. Them? It's a power moms. Standing. They're showboating. They're grandstanding. Right. They're trying to outbake everybody. I've had it. I've worst. had it up. To, they've, we've already been to school. Why right. are we up at the school hanging out? I don't care if the had teacher sees I'm great. We're done. Yeah, I don't have any desire to go back to school I and grandstand. Drop the kids off and leave. Why are they up there? What, what are, are they, they doing? There? <laughs> also, the text messages <laughs> just make you for, for, feel bad. Oh, right. You've forgotten a million things. Yes. And they blow up your phone. Okay. Therefore, you're not paying attention to your own children. Right, right because you're trying to answer all these texts <laughs> that don't my, matter. My favorite part is she said, what are you still doing there? <laughs> Drop your kid off and leave. They're yes, grandstanding. Yes, I'm dying. Okay, it's wait, we want to be friends with when is your Wait, when's your tour? Okay, We so, can't say the name of it on TV. No, That's we right. cannot, but you can go to our Instagram at I've Had It, and we have new tour dates. So next month, we're going to Atlanta, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and then the month after that will be New York, Toronto, New York. and Chicago. Oh, we're going to New York. Will you all come back here and make us laugh? Yes. 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 So we might we even get you some tickets. Oh, yeah. Okay. Fun. Okay. We're coming. Okay. And y'all can listen uh, to their podcast. Oh, my God. Y'all are so funny. You get why everybody <laughs> loves you. Um, wherever y'all get your podcast. Coming up next, light summer shrimp skewers <laughs> that are packed with flavor. <laughs> Do you <laughs> like it? Have you had it or hit it with the shrimp Oh, skewers? my God. That's hilarious. <laughs> How many moms have come up and Chef and TV personality Manit Chohan, one of the chefs featured in the annual Guest Chef series from our sponsor, the Lorne Hotels in Bermuda. Manit is here to show us how to make tandoori shrimp skewers. Oh, Manit. So Hi. delicious. This You're speaking amazing. our language. I mean, think of these wonderful flavors mm. with the pristine waters yes, of you Bermuda. Have to it's us. beautiful. Please you tell us about that annual Guest Chef series. Is oh, it awesome? The Guest Chef series are amazing, mm. like incredible chefs, delicious food mm. and Lorraine Hotel in Bermuda is amazing. Oh. It's we beautiful. We've heard it's fab. Yes. Yeah. So to make the kebabs, the first thing we do is go ahead and Dun -dun. cut. 
cut uh, the uh, vegetables, whatever vegetables you want. Mm -hmm. I have peppers and onions and mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Just make it into equal uh, cubes so yes. that it's easy to yes, skewer. skewer. Got it. Okay. Right over here. Okay. Then we make a marinade, and the marinade is really simple. We start off with some yogurt. 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 Right over here. Can it be any percent? Do you uh, know what I mean? Or you do know, you like full fat? Full fat, Just full do fat gives more flavor. Okay. Yeah. But if you want to uh, stay like, healthier, you can use no fat. Or if you just have 2% Greek, and it's Whatever Greek, right? Or no? You can use regular Greek, makes uh, gives Thick. the coating really nice. Yeah. What was so, that ingredient you just placed? That in? was ginger garlic paste, equal amounts ginger of ginger garlic and garlic paste. blended. Ooh. There is some tandoori masala, which you can get mm, at any of, of the course. regular grocery stores. Some fenugreek uh, herbs. This is, uh, again, you can get it online or mm -hmm. at any of the Indian okay. stores. Wonderful smoky flavor to okay. it. Okay. So you mix it and then you go ahead. So that's and your marinade. It's thick. It's like a thick yeah. marinade, right? And shrimp is great, but you can use any protein. Mm. Right. Right. Chicken. 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 Oh, so you stick beef, everything in there. And everything coat it. in there. Mm -hmm. So you leave the tail on the shrimp. You like yes, it like that? Okay. Absolutely. All right. So you mix that all together. Mix it all together. Put it on skewers right uh -huh. over here. Look at this. So you skew it up, and now we're going to put it on the grill. Do on you the mind? grill. Go for it. Absolutely. Add oh. a little salt. Yes. So Just hear the sizzle. I love that sizzle. So let me ask you this, because the veggies probably take longer to cook than the fish. So how do you do that? The, the shrimp, way you I mean. cut the vegetables, just make sure that they are They're thin. Cut, they are thin. Uh, so then they cook at an equal, equal pace. pace. Oh, okay. wow, that's smart. Good tip. Okay. And then along with this, we are going to be serving this really delicious chutney. It's a I tomato love chutney. chutney. I love chutney. Tomato chutney. Mango chutney, chutney I love mango. too. Oh, you can actually also use mango in place okay. of tomatoes. Okay. So right over here, we have some oil. We are going to go ahead and put some five spice, Indian five spice okay. called Panchpuran. Once the spices start to dance, they have to dance. That's Kicking. when they are yes. uh, releasing the true potential. We put in the tomatoes. Okay. Beautiful. Some brown sugar, mm -hmm. some white vinegar, add some spice with some chilies right over Ooh, here. So make it give it a little kick, huh? Kick and some salt. And Stir so that's your chutney. How long yeah, does that need to cook you, down so for? Until it's nice and jammy Jam. around 15 minutes. Jammy. Mm. But this is, I mean, we, we had grills. I was there over the 4th of July weekend at the Lorraine. Mm -hmm. Bermuda is mm. gorgeous. And just imagine all of this delicious food, chefs from all over the country going for the chef series. Mm. It's absolutely amazing. That chutney. This is delicious. Oh, and that yes. shrimp is so mm -hmm. good. Isn't it? Mm. Really, thank you so, so much. Mm -hmm. It's so yummy. Thank you, thank you. To get thank the recipe, you. go to todaygot.com slash food. A big, big thank you to the Loren Hotels. The Guest Chef Series is going on right now through August of 27. Yes. Yes. Thank you so That's much, Penny. Awesome. Coming up next, y'all, my book club is in session. So if you've been reading along, author Tao Tai is here. You're not going to want to miss it. Check it out. She's going to talk all about her book. Author Tao Tai, whose debut novel, Banyan Moon, is this month's Read with Jenna book club pick. Okay, it's one of my favorite books. I love it. If you have not read it, it's not too late. It's a beautiful story about three generations of Vietnamese women. Take a look. Anne Tran's life is perfectly choreographed. She has a successful career, a charming boyfriend, and a beautiful lake house. But a positive pregnancy test and a betrayal change everything. 
When her beloved grandmother passes away, Anne's forced to return home to her estranged mother and a house that carries generations of family secrets. Spanning from 1960s Vietnam to the present-day swamplands of the Florida coast, Banyan Moon is a story of mothers and daughters, of what we pass down to the next generation, and what we choose to leave behind. Okay, Ooh. that was, by the way, beautiful. If that trailer doesn't make you want to read it, I don't know what will. Welcome, <laughs> Tao. We also want to say hello to the Subtle Asian Book Club. These lovely ladies, their mission is to amplify Asian storytellers. By the way, this group has more than 15,000 members around the world. They've raised more than $4,000 for various nonprofits to support AAPI in that community. And they have traveled here from all over yes. the country to be part of this. So we just want to say welcome. Yo, and we're thank y'all for being here. here. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so Tal, this book, I loved it. Mm -hmm. I've told you that. I've gushed over it. Where did the spark of the idea come from? Mm -hmm. Well, so I come from a line of very strong women. They have beautiful stories and they have this will to survive and to protect their children. And so I always wanted to pay homage to their journey and how they got here from Vietnam. But then when I became a mother, I started thinking a lot about these issues of inheritance. And as you mm -hmm. said, what we choose to keep, what we choose to pass along. And this all kind of coalesced in Banyan Moon and the Tran women who have such a complicated and fierce love for each other. I think it's so interesting because your main character chose to show just a part of her initially. And I think a lot of people yeah. who've come over as immigrants can relate to that. They're like, that's the part that I'm going to present, but the rest of this history, I'm going to tuck away. Absolutely. And one of the main characters, she um, has this very curated image. You mm -hmm. know, she wants people to see her in a certain way. And the truth is, she is messy, but in all the most beautiful ways. Mm -hmm. And it takes her a really long time to be at home with that and it takes a homecoming which is sometimes yeah. what we need right we need to go back to where we started to find who we are now and hear mm -hmm. the voices of those that came before right literally and figuratively <laughs> in this case this made me miss my grandmother yes. so much this mm -hmm. book so if yes. any of you loved your grandmothers mm -hmm. um, you should pick it up okay now we have to get to all of you incredible women we have questions from our book book club first up is Alexandra I personally love this book so much and one of my favorite elements was the Banyan House and how that in many ways represented the diaspora search for a home. Um, so my question is, did you have a Banyan House growing up and what inspired you to include this in your story? Yeah, great question. Yeah, it's a great question. So the Banyan House is its own character. It's wild and it's decrepit <laughs> and it's falling apart, but it's also full of all this history. So I didn't grow up with a Banyan House house, but I certainly grew up in traditions where houses meant so much. I would go down the street and look in windows and imagine what was going on behind the scenes. And so that really influenced um, the book in, in, in this novel. And also I grew up um, by the Ringling Museum in Sarasota, which has this, these huge sprawling grounds and these banyan trees. Yes. They're humongous. Yeah. They are grotesque. They kind of grow out. And as a kid, you know, playing among those yeah. trees, mm -hmm. that is ripe for imagination. So I combined both those things into the Banyan House, which you will see very prominently featured in the book. Yeah, and Florida <laughs> plays such yes, a part that kind exactly. of lush landscape. We have, we have Miss Tiffany next. Hi, <laughs> Tiffany. Hi, again, we loved your book so much. And as I mentioned, Banyan Moon is a multi-generational tale detailing a family through life and also death. So we were really curious how you went about navigating the different experiences and emotions, since all the characters are of different ages and backgrounds. Absolutely. So the voice that came to me the clearest was Min's. She's the grandmother. She is very assertive and opinionated. And that was just such a fun character to write, you know, because she says a lot of the things you're not supposed to say. Mm -hmm. So I loved that about her. But then the more I wrote the book, the more the other women's voices started coming in. And I was thinking a lot about their struggles and how they would interpret the same events. It's kind of like a kaleidoscope. You know, you see the image, but then with one twist, it becomes something totally different. Mm -hmm. So I love loved playing with that in the book. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, it's so awesome. Okay, our final question. Zara. Hi. Hi. Um, we really, really loved the book. Like, we couldn't put it down. And while we were reading it, we were thinking about Asian culture, how it tends to favor um, male figures yeah. in their household. Mm -hmm. But, which we loved, your book <laughs> flipped the script and put women at the forefront. So we were just curious, uh, why was that so important for you to explore in this book? 
Yeah, so I think in a lot of portrayals we see um, the the Vietnamese American man as sort of the head of the household, but that was never the case for my family. <laughs> my uh, family, um, the voices were from the women and they would make a lot of the decisions and I remember being in the kitchens and my grandmother, my aunt, my mother, they would exchange gossip and tell a history and um, exchange their recipes too and it was just this beautiful melody and there was something so intimate and powerful about these experiences and also when you talk about the Vietnam War a lot of times you see the heroism of the soldiers the men in combat but there there yeah. was heroism happening at home too yeah. it's the quieter work of yeah. raising children of surviving and I thought that was so important to bring to the forefront in Banyan Moon oh wow. you guys Banyan Moon awesome. didn't you love it so much yes. <laughs> well, you guys did so good uh, being on TV and asking your yeah. questions <laughs> Very good job. Okay, it's not too late, you guys. If you have not read Banyan Moon, check it out. Go to day.com slash read with Jenna. Um, and if you're in New York right now, by the way, Tao will be across the street signing oh, cool. books at the NBC stores at 11 a.m. You have five minutes. Yeah, hurry. <laughs> go, go, hurry. go. Hurry, go, go. Bring all your friends. <laughs> all right. Um, we and thank you, thank you, thank you. We will be back right after this. Thank you so much. Up. Why don't we look at a few more of Miles's pictures? He took some behind the scenes photos look. for us. Oh, wow! Good capture. Miles. Right mid bite. Always eating. These oh are my God. awesome. These are really good. Thank you, thank you, wow. Miles. Wow, Miles, you're, you're a so pro. talented. Yo, and tomorrow we have Alejandra Ramos. She's making Way to go. empanadas. And you're going to get to, we're going to talk with our <laughs> DIY queen coming up. Bye. <laughs> we're, we're not sure what's happening. <laughs> Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. The miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. I scream, you scream, I, okay, I'm gonna stop right there because I know you know how it goes. We are here at New York City's legendary Lexington Candy Shop. Happens to be my neighborhood luncheonette. And there was a time when soda fountains and diners like this were all over New York City and all over the country. Whether it's a cone, a sundae, or, hmm, 
an ice cream float. I gotta tell you, there's nothing that brings back memories like places like these. Today, we're getting the scoop and diving into the history of America's beloved sweet shops. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. It's no coincidence that here at the Lexington Candy Shop, one of New York City's most iconic soda fountains, they serve ice cream from the city of brotherly love. It's Bassett's, the oldest ice cream company in America. In fact, Philadelphia is home to many early ice cream innovations. And at the Franklin Fountain, we've got two brothers who have recreated a turn of the century fountain that celebrates Philadelphia's unique contribution to American ice cream history. We're very proud to be called Soda Jerks. In the heyday of soda fountains, being called a jerk was a good thing. A soda jerk is someone that jerks the handle on the soda fountain. We are the Burley Brothers. I'm Ryan. And I'm Eric Burley. Welcome. Come on in. Stepping into the Franklin Fountain is like time traveling to a bygone era. I've always felt a kinship for the turn of the century. It just feels like maybe I was there in a past life. The Burley family originally purchasing this historic property in 2002, but they weren't sure what to do with the storefront until inspiration struck. The building is really what inspired us uh, to do what we do here. It was built around 1899, and the original tin ceiling remains as well as the penny tile floor. So we really thought that a soda fountain kind of looked right for the space. There's certainly a sense of awe and wonder, sort of a, a transport through the time machine when you walk in the door, and that was really intentional. The brothers working for nearly two years to restore the space. It is not for the faint of heart to restore any old building. It's a labor of love. And frankly, we wouldn't have it any other way. It's part of the handmade nature of everything that we do here. The kitchen itself was a preservation element, restoring the motor on the buttercream machine, fixing the belts. You know, the restoration of the building wasn't just the facade, but it's also the back of house spaces. They also embarked on a mission to recreate an authentic fountain experience. We took a number of road trips, in part to learn about the ice cream business, and then we would always pair soda fountain tours with those. So visiting places in the American South, going down to New Orleans, going to Savannah, seeing these old fashioned soda fountain places, interviewing the soda jerks, the pharmacists, and really learning the culture of the soda fountain was a big part of our research. Today, while we may take the simple pleasure of eating an ice cream cone for granted, that wasn't always the case. I'm Sarah Lohman. I'm a food historian, author, and ice cream expert. Let's go back to when ice cream was a luxury, largely available to only the richest of Americans. We don't think of these as expensive ingredients today, but ice and sugar historically were very rare, and so only the wealthiest people could afford them. So it was usually made in the home, and by home I mean a large grand estate, by people who had servants, and then eventually people who owned other people. We're talking about the enslaved. So you also needed that literal manpower to make it. That all begins to change in the 19th century as technology and supplies change. Traditionally, European ice cream was made with a custard base that included eggs. But a simpler style emerged in Philadelphia. I think Philadelphia is the most important city to ice cream history, maybe Pennsylvania as a whole, because we had the invention of Philadelphia style ice cream by a black man. Augustus Jackson, a black man who was a White House chef working under multiple presidents, including Andrew Jackson, is credited with advancing a new type of ice cream and method. And he came up with an ice cream base that didn't use eggs, but was just as like creamy and luscious, but could be made with less ingredients, made quicker, and he supposedly had really, really tasty flavors too. A free man, 
He later moved back to his native Philadelphia to start his own business. So he made it and sold it, but then he also sold it to other ice cream shops too and became very famous and very wealthy for this new style of ice cream. Jackson's contributions made ice cream more widely available to more consumers. Philadelphia is also home to the oldest ice cream company in America, Bassett's. I'm Alex Bassett Strange, was my great, great, great grandfather that started this company all the way back in 1861. And we're proud to be here today. Bassett's was the first merchant to sign a lease in Philadelphia's historic Reading Terminal Market. And the family is still there serving up scoops today. Bassett's ice cream is a 16.5% butterfat ice cream, and it's what's called a Philadelphia style, which means that it's made without any egg yolk. Innovations to ice cream production, allowing more shops like Bassett's to open up in the early 1900s, and that ushered in a new type of meeting place where folks could socialize. And then we also had ice cream saloons. Now, the name there is key, saloon, yeah, means bar. And at this time, bars were places where only men could go, but ice cream saloons were one of the first public spaces that was socially acceptable for women to go to. So to have a public space was really meaningful to women. To have a space where you felt free, to have a space where you could safely flirt. Soda fountains and parlors became even more popular and almost necessary during the 1920s. When prohibition hits and we ban the sale of alcohol, then there's really a need for these public spaces for people to gather and socialize outside of the home. And as we move into the soda fountain era, we have a lot of creativity in adding ice cream to different flavors of soda and making these incredible concoctions and sundaes. If you were a soda jerk at the turn of the century, you were kind of a local celebrity. Today, the jerks in charge at Franklin Fountain are serving up nostalgia along with their vintage creations. It's one of our newer uh, soda syrups. It's uh, made with real watermelon fruit. Come over here to our 1905 soda fountain. Yeah. Mm, that is really good. Uh, you know, I don't want to mess with that flavor too much, so I'll just go with vanilla. Uh, vanilla ice cream just rounds everything out nice, plays nice at the playground. And the bean specks on the vanilla show that it's made with real vanilla, not vanillin. And that's an old Philadelphia tradition of having bean specks in their vanilla ice cream. Franklin Fountain's menu focuses on classics, but they also bring back long forgotten flavors. Summer hits like black walnut that tend to be kind of bitter, but mixed with enough sweetness can be really unique and good. Other flavors like pawpaws, which are our native fruit here in North America. While others misses. Uh, a flavor that kind of bombed here, uh, as an example, I'll tell you, it was orange pineapple. Like we really wanted to bring back orange pineapple as an ice cream, which was really popular at the turn of the century. But the Burleys aren't just passionate about their flavors. They are working to keep a tasty tradition alive. Our business has really enabled the preservation of a couple of historic buildings here on the block. And we hope that the, the fountain and the institution of the soda fountain continues and you know can be passed to succeeding generations of uh, soda jerks. Coming up, I visit a family-owned ice cream shop in Harlem and get a sweet surprise.
finish this sentence. Ice cream is... Love. Ice cream is not easy to make. <laughs> and see. Ya. We're up here in Harlem where the forecast is partly cloudy with a 100% chance of sprinkles. Why? Because we're outside Sugar Hill Creamery where they're bringing the community together one scoop at a time. Let's check it out. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Hi, How nice to you? meet you. That's Nick and Petrushka Larson, husband and wife, and parents to Isla, Zadie, and Nico. So let's talk ice cream. They're also the owners of Harlem's Sugar Hill Creamery, which the couple opened in their beloved neighborhood in 2017. We're gonna give you the scoop, Al. Bam! For the couple, that bam moment came after meeting up with friends in DC for some premium scoops. We had small batch delicious ice cream, and that is when it hit us that this was not an experience that we could have in our own neighborhood. The realization that they couldn't do this in Harlem was the beginning of their sweet journey. When Nick and I started dating, he always said he wanted to own a food establishment of some sort. And then this you know, moment in life kind of presented the opportunity. Petrushka oversees the shop's marketing and business, while Nick, well, he develops their artisanal flavors, often looking to the neighborhood for inspiration. The great thing about having a small shop, you see in real time, oh yeah, they don't like this, <laughs> right? And, and uh, you know, and our friends from Harlem, they are not shy to be like, yo, no, no, yeah. this is no yeah. good. <laughs> so your flavors are nods to Harlem. To the, nods the, to Harlem, nods to our respective cultures as well. So my, I'm black, African-American, and from the Caribbean, and Nick is from the Midwest and was raised on a farm. We're channeling Harlem, we're channeling childhood memories, we're channeling the way that we were raised, what we were eating. I think this is the best uh, example of channeling our neighborhood. So we have a, a, a flavor called Cafe Tuba, and where the first location is, it's like a few blocks from Little Senegal. The flavor Cafe Tuba uses coffee from Senegal. We incorporate peanut brittle and the lean pepper brownies. So it's a bit of a twist on a classic, which we like to say we make, you know, twists on classics and then all their flavors that you wouldn't expect. Many features of the scoop shop pay homage to Harlem, starting with the name. Where we're sitting right now is a neighborhood that is adjacent to Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill is a neighborhood in Harlem that at the turn of the 20th century was the, the place where upwardly mobile black people resided and, and came to, right? It was also the home of the Harlem Renaissance too. Many artists, activists were living here. You know, you talk about the history and homages to this neighborhood. Uh, was there some thoughts about the, that historic uh, ice cream shop, Bumford's? Yes. Just before opening Sugar Hill, Patricia learned about an iconic Harlem institution, Tomford's small group of octogenarian Harlemites that just happened to be at this conference and they were like, hey, she's opening an happy ice cream shop. This is crazy. And you're like, oh my gosh, It'll, it's like Tomford. Tomford's was in business from 1903 to 1983, located in the heart of Harlem at 125th and St. Nicholas. Unlike many early soda fountains, it catered to black patrons, providing much more than food and ice cream. It was the place that people went after, you know, church uh, on a date. And we didn't know about it when we decided to open the shop, but after we learned about it, before we opened the shop, we definitely channeled the, the history and spirit of that place here. Sugar Hill's motto? The sweet life is a love affair between community and food. And it also has a historical meaning. The sweet life is also, you know, a reference to the Great Migration. You know, when people moved to Sugar Hill, they were looking forward to sweet life. We wanted to give our neighbors a little bit of sweet life as well, right? Nick and Petrushka are hopeful that their spot will become the place for making family memories down the line. Later down the line is to hear stories like people talking about Tom Birds that are talking about what, you know, what we meant to them, right? To be a place where somebody could come in and say, my parents met here. What an honor. And I, think, I don't think that we take our role as, you know, the people who created this company lightly. Like, it is such an honor to be able to serve our neighbors and to also be a place that they continue to come back to. 
I think that a lot of us have really fond memories of going with our family um, and having ice cream on a hot summer day, or like rolling past a rural ice cream stand and it's just like packed with Little League kids. Or when you live in a city, you've got your local ice cream place that you can walk to and the whole neighborhood is there. And as for the future of Sugar Hill Creamery? With, with three kids, uh, Nick, are, are you hoping that out of those three, one of them is going to carry on the tradition? It's a tricky question. Yes, I would, but you know, I'm not gonna pressure them. At the very least, we need them to work here during exactly. high school. Exactly. Okay? <laughs> <laughs>
is to form it, the tip is to like kind of scrape it, right? So if you're like just learning, the best way is just a little bit at the top, like that. Sides and boom. And you, you form it with the side. Oh, right? so you're forming the ball. The ball, the yeah, exactly. All right, voila. Ta-da. Right? So the cup, now we'll get a little rinse. A rinse. Okay, so you, you start. You can well, also uh, grab out the sides there too, because oh, it's a little, little softer. Mm -hmm. almost, oh, that's a sad yeah. scoop. No, no, look, now good. you're going to form oh, it. Oh, now it's forming. Now you're... Mm -hmm. Now it's forming. Oh, yep, look at look that. At that. Now. Oh, See? hey, now we're talking. There it is. Wow. There it is. Good. Hey, now. All right, let's taste. All, All right. right. Time to taste. The Al Roker. Cheers. Well, actually... Oh, we also have a special name for it. Oh, what's that? It's uh, Your Neck of the Woods. Oh, I like it. it. <laughs> wow. And this, this is, is great. Yeah. Like all Sugar Hill flavors, there's an art to naming the ice cream. For example, their best-selling blueberry cheesecake? Well, it's named for Petrushka. So this is uh, named after my wife, who's the chairperson of the board. She's the boss. This is the boss flavor. Smart man. This is the, this is the chief. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Mm. My work here is done. Coming up, a whimsical creamery in Las Vegas, known for its colorful creations. You know the old saying, what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas, especially when it comes to a hot spot that's known for creating really cool desserts, Creamberry. These folks are recreating the ice cream parlor experience for a whole new generation of ice cream fans. And whether that's in person or via social media posts. Selfie anyone? I've seen some kids who can kill the burrito by themselves. Most adults funny they would share <laughs> in las vegas a few miles off the strip is the flashy fabulous and insta famous ice cream shop creamberry opened in 2016 by husband and wife team danny and rosalina c hoping to create a one-stop dessert cafe we set on a mission to bring in a wide variety of crazy innovative desserts into one place for danny it was a dream come true. I've always had a sweet tooth when I was younger, and I've always loved ice cream. Rosalina, not so much right away. She favored traditional icy desserts from her native Indonesia, not American ice cream. We love sweet stuff, but we don't uh, really love like ice cream, ice cream, but more to like shave ice. I said, why don't we bring our Indonesia dessert to our menu? And just like that, Creamberry started offering shaved ice. So we have the secret ingredients, which is the sauce, the red one, that make it very good with the condensed milk, with everything fruit on top or the shaved ice, and then it's a good combination. Danny's focus was on the full menu, adding unique treats from around the world to Creamberry, desserts like Thai rolled ice cream and Filipino halo halo. Recognizing the power of social media, 
Rosalina began posting photos and videos of their decadent creations to Instagram, and then later to TikTok. It's a practice that keeps modern ice cream parlors relevant, according to food historian Sarah Lohman. I think social media is important because, I mean, there's, there's people out there who are following ice cream places that maybe, maybe they'll go to, maybe they'll never go to, but it's like the visual appeal. Most people who buy cookbooks don't actually cook the recipes. It's like they flip through the pages to go on a journey. I think like social media and like ice cream social media lets us do that as well. One of their most eye-catching treats, the legendary cotton candy burrito, a social media and IRL favorite. Ooh, another one, maybe, ooh, look at this, the giant burrito. Oh, the birthday burrito. It. Yeah, the birthday burrito. I think that should be perfect for today. Hashtag genius. The cotton candy burrito proves that something savory can be the sweetest inspiration. I was having Mexican dinner one night and, uh, of course, eating burritos and tacos. That's where it gave me the idea, hey, why don't I try to experiment this into a dessert? And, lo and behold, it actually worked. Rosalina was immediately impressed. I was like, man, that's a good idea. Creamberry was one of the first shops in the U.S. to offer the viral treat, but it took a few tries to perfect. As everybody knows, cotton candy is very fragile, and any type of a moisture or it will just ruin the cotton candy. The first step in the process isn't posted on social media. Spinning the cotton candy is one of our trade secrets for our cotton candy burrito. So we, we usually spin it in the back in the kitchen. The couple's young sons also deserve a shout out for their love of cotton candy and its impact on their business. Our kids love cotton candy, so that's why that's the first time that we bring the cotton candy to our shop. So what's more important, how their desserts look or how they taste? Both. Both. <laughs> if customers come in and they're visually attracted to it and they try it and it doesn't taste good, they're not going to come back yeah. and, and get the same dessert. So we eat with our eyes, right? So there's always been effort and consideration to the appearance of food, but the more photographs we can take and the wider they get spread, like with the spread of Instagram and social media, I, I think there's been even more of a sort of focus on how our food looks on camera. And ice cream is sort of the perfect medium for that. Like you can have a really wild color. You can have this like a really elaborate sundae, or you can have something that's just like really bold and beautiful. And luckily, because it's ice cream, it all still tastes good while looking good at the same time. Other Insta and TikTok worthy finds include their made to order ice cream tacos and wild milkshakes. For Rosalina, the more social interaction, the better. We really love to see the comments, how many likes we got, and then, you know, like a lot of people repost it too. And those comments, good and bad, help the duo refine their creations. Sometimes people say, oh, don't put too much sprinkle candy or whatever it is. And then sometimes we take it like, oh yeah, maybe not too much, it's maybe only a little bit. Yeah, it's very helpful for us yes. as well because then at least we can adjust what, what is necessary and to accommodate the customers. The virtual shares are sweet, but it's even sweeter when followers from around the world get to try Creamberry. We can never get enough of seeing all the smiles when the customers get their orders. Just the, the facial expression that they give us. In an era when we're bombarded with options, the simple joy of heading out for ice cream has withstood the test of time. I think that ice cream shops, spaces, parlors, ice creameries have survived because they've always fulfilled that community space and that family space. It's something that everybody can come together around. And families behind the counter will keep scooping up sweet memories for years to come. Ah, the avocado. From toast topping to sweet treats, even mac and cheese, this tasty green fruit is pretty much everywhere. But did you know the most popular variety, the Haas avocado, was developed right here in Southern California. So I came all the way across the country to find out how farmers and restaurant owners are making sure we're enjoying these for years to come. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. 
Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We call this right here the avocado tunnel of love. <laughs> In the past 20 years, believe it or not, avocado consumption has tripled in the United States. Today, the average American eats eight pounds of these babies every year. I'm at Rancho Vasquez, one of the oldest avocado orchards in the country. Here, the Vasquez family grows several different varieties. Let's avocado check it out. Oh, welcome to Rancho Vasquez. Art? Yes, Nice Art. to meet you. How's it going, sir? Damian Vasquez. Damian, nice welcome to see to you guys. Army veteran Art Vasquez has turned his love for avocados into a true family obsession. Four generations live together on this scenic ranch. Many of them work in the orchard and help run the business. I've never been to an avocado farm. Wow. So uh, it'll be gonna, a lot of fun. You guys gonna give me a tour? Absolutely. All right, let's go. Art's grandfather, Refugio Morones, moved to the U.S. from Mexico in the 1920s. He picked avocados and citrus fruit on several farms, but always dreamed of having his own orchard. When Art was seven, the family purchasing their first acre of this ranch. And that's when my grandfather, Refugio, would start teaching me how to take care of the trees. That's when I, I really started loving picking. My brother and I would pick the avocados, take the avocados down to the town, knocking on doors, selling the avocados. Art put his passion for produce on hold to pursue a career in the auto parts industry. In 2002, he was able to buy the entire property, which was destined to be raised for new houses. We've taken it from 250 trees all the way up to 3,750 trees. This is something, a sustainable legacy that I can leave here and teach my children, grandkids, and the family how to work the earth, how to grow things organically. Art had also saved a piece of Golden State history. Avocados are native to Mexico, but some of the first avocado trees in the U.S. were planted in L.A. County in the mid-1800s. Henry Dalton, a wealthy trader who owned ranches in California, fell in love with the fruit during trips to Central America. In 1848, Henry planted the first avocado tree in Azusa. So when he moved to Los Angeles and he took over and bought Rancho Azusa, he knew there was fresh water coming from the Azusa Canyon. And so because of having the fresh water source and the awesome soil, he knew avocados would be great here. During a tour of the ranch, I got to see a living part of that history. What makes it special is one of the first planted avocado trees in the Western United States. This puppy is one of a kind. It's like us, Al. It's one of a kind, <laughs> okay. And it's still producing fruit? Still producing fruit. It produces anywhere between 500 to six, 700 pounds of fruit a year. Experts estimate this tree is more than 100 years old. It produces a type of avocado known as the fuerte, in Spanish meaning strong. It was the first avocado variety to thrive in the United States because it can withstand cooler temperatures. But in the 1920s, a new variety emerged in SoCal that would ultimately dominate the world market. A guy by the name of Rudolf Haas, he was actually a postal carrier, but his hobby was growing. So he had an orchard at his house about 20 miles from here, La Habra Heights. The Haas avocado was a total accident. An amateur farmer, Rudolf had purchased some mystery avocado seeds. When the tree matured, he was surprised by the dark, bumpy fruit it produced. And that really took off commercially because it has a thicker skin. So for shipping purposes, and it's an amazing tasting fruit. The Fuerte and many other avocados stay green when mature, but the skin on a hasp turns black when ripe, hiding any bruises. It didn't take off right away among consumers in the U.S. So it took a few marketing campaigns for Americans to embrace this creamy variety of the fruit. This fourth, put a little green in your red, white, and blue. Today, 80% of avocados grown worldwide are Hass. Now here, 
This is one of the first host trees commercially ever planted. We've got two host trees right here. Until the 90s, the majority of avocados consumed in the country were grown in California and weren't available year round. But all that changed in 1994. President Clinton made NAFTA the law today, linking the United States to Canada and Mexico in one large trading block. When NAFTA passed, avocados from Mexico became available everywhere, and folks could enjoy them anytime. Today, even named avocado toast a top trend of the 2010s. Avocado toast. I'm not sure how this happened, but there came a time in the past 10 years when people began to realize that their lives were not complete without it. Thanks to clever campaigns, new diet trends, and an abundant supply, avocado consumption has boomed in the last two decades, growing into a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, 90% of those avocados come from Mexico. However, this has led to major environmental impacts like deforestation. Rancho Vasquez wants to combat the negative effects of monoculture farming. As an organic orchard, they follow strict guidelines to help protect the land. How have the trees and what you grow tried to lessen the impact on the environment? We pick the weeds by hand. Are we weedy? Because it's all organic. Yeah. So we don't ever spray any weed kill or anything like that. The deer come and eat all the lower leaves and skirt the trees for us. Ah. And they turn that into natural manure. Now, when it comes to picking, avocados require a gentle touch. So we still do it the same high-tech way they did it 100 years ago. Wow. You this is my grandfather's pole? pole right here. Really? Yeah, this is one of the old school ones. So you can pick any of these you want. Okay. So yeah, you just slide it right up till the avocado goes in the basket, and then you pull on the rope. There you go, you're almost there. Pretty different, you're doing pretty darn yeah. good, you know? A little bit further, and then pull the rope. There you there go, you is. got it. <laughs> good job. <laughs> He's a, he's a catch. <laughs> Ta-da! There you go. My That's first a nice avocado. One too. It's going to take a week to a week and a half right now to ripen and let it get soft. How about going and tasting some? Yes, sir. We picked some about a week or so, so they'd be perfect for you. All right, let's do it. Believe it or not, there are more than 400 varieties of avocados. Rancho Vasquez in Azusa, California sells six. The Fuerte, Hass, Lamhass, Reed, Pinkerton, and Gem. Each has a different shape, taste, and growing season. I've never seen such a, like, a round avocado. The ranch's avocados are prized by chefs and customers for their high oil content. That comes from the area's climate, nutrient-rich mountain soil, and secret farming techniques that have been passed down for generations. The higher the oil content, the better the tasting fruit is. Mm -hmm. And then the longer it'll stay green. You can taste and see the difference with their organic hass. It just keeps it oh, really You can literally fresh. see the oil coming out of there. Yeah, so if you want to try just a little chunk, we'll give you a little chunk. Oh, that's great. Next up, the family favorite, Fuerte. Oh, a real, really a different flavor. Absolutely, absolutely. 
There's almost, it's almost like a saltiness and a creaminess in there. Aside from his wife's guac, Art's favorite way to eat avos is actually with honey. Ooh. It's called avocado dulce, which is avocado candy. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Isn't it great? I would have never thought of that. Guys, this is just amazing. What does it mean for both of you to, to be owners of this, of this legacy? This is a legacy I do want to leave. My family, my grandkids, Damien, and this will be around for, I'm hoping and praying, for at least another 100 years, you know? And what does it mean for you, Damien? Oh, it's like he said, just a place where history can keep going. Because the trees were here before us, and they're gonna be here after us, so we're just kind of stewards of the land in the meantime. Let's share a little of this guacamole. Yes, sir. Yep. Let the chips fall where they may, as long as they've got guacamole on them. Avila's El Ranchito is a Southern California staple that's been in business for more than half a century. They've got 13 locations and counting of this family-run chain, but no two restaurants are exactly the same. Every Avila's owner puts their own spin on the family's traditional Mexican recipes. But here at the Seal Beach Outpost, they claim to have the best guacamole. So I've come to learn their secrets. It's time to guac and roll. Hey there, wow, got a lot of folks here. The aunts, uncles, siblings, and cousins behind Avalas El Ranchito really treat their guests like family. This location is run by Elise Avila Smith, a third generation restaurateur. She credits the family's success to her grandma Margarita's hospitality. You know, she just focused on really what we focus on good, fresh food. Salvador and Margarita, or Mama Avila, immigrated from Mexico to the U.S. in 1958. How did they get into the restaurant business? My father had an opportunity to buy a restaurant and talked to my mother and decided, you know, this is a great opportunity. Salvador using his life savings to purchase the old restaurant property in Huntington Park. He turned to his six kids, including Elise's dad, Victor, for support. We would go after school and help them do whatever needed to be done. And my father was pretty much during the day taking care of the whole restaurant and my mother was in the kitchen. So she was the only one in the kitchen. And then. Grandpa Polder was well, washing yeah. dishes. <laughs> Mama's traditional recipes have been passed down through many generations. They've come from way, way back in Mexico. When it first opened in 1966, Avila's was the only Mexican restaurant in the mostly white neighborhood. Many customers had no interest in Mama's traditional dishes, 
So she developed a strategy to draw people in. It seemed like natural for my mother to offer the people whatever they wanted. So it was more like a home. If they didn't have it on the menu, then my mother would go in the kitchen and make it anyway. Over the next three decades, the Avila siblings opened six new restaurants in Southern California. This expansion wasn't a coincidence. Americans at the same time were falling in love with Mexican food. In the early 80s, there were an estimated 2,500 Mexican restaurants in the U.S. Today, there are more than 60,000. I was busting tables here as a child. <laughs> Elise witnessed that growth as a kid, watching her dad expand the family business. So I grew up doing homework in a booth. On top of that, I grew up with my grandparents living one street over from me. So I grew up cooking with her for years and years. After college, Elise tried working in other fields, but she was always drawn back to the restaurants. I'd be working by day, you know, I worked for a magazine. And then my brother opened his first restaurant and I ended up serving tables at night. So no matter what I did, I kept ending up back in this business and I loved it. I realized that this was my passion, it's in my blood. How do you qualify to open up a, an Avila? Well, it's process, let me tell you. <laughs> Is it really? I had to work every position in the restaurant. So I washed dishes, I worked in the kitchen for a few years. I've done it all. After proving herself for a decade, Elise opened her own Avila's in 2015. When I first opened my restaurant, I worked for several months from about six in the morning till midnight. And finally, I remember my dad and my brother came in for an intervention and said, you need to go home. You gotta sleep. <laughs> you gotta sleep. <laughs> so I went home and they ran my restaurant for the night. And I knew with my dad and my brother here, there was nothing to worry about. Uh -huh. Every Avila's restaurant is unique, reflecting the family member who owns it and the location. They have different decor and specialty menu items. Elise puts her own spin on the brand by offering an extensive tequila cocktail menu. Dad, I'm gonna make you a drink right now. Make it strong. <laughs> Salud, mija. Mm. But there are several dishes you're gonna find at every location. Avocados are crucial to many of the family recipes, including the signature guacamole and their beloved chicken soup. Tell me right. about Mama Avila's soup. It's that soup that feels like home to me. But it is a chicken breast and rice soup. We make it from scratch every morning, including the broth. We put fresh avocado, cilantro, onion, and tomato in it. And people go, and the first thing they do when they get off the plane is go to have some chicken soup. You mentioned avocado goes into the soup. Tell me about the importance of avocado. It's part of our culture. Bottom line is nobody wants to eat Mexican food without avocado and some guacamole. <laughs> so I'm curious. First you, Victor, what's the secret to a good guacamole? You have to make it, you know, almost really as on a daily basis, almost an hourly basis. It needs to be fresh, it needs to be well seasoned. And a little bit of love. I like to think I make a good guac, but I, <laughs> I'm sure I can learn from the best. So how about showing me how you guys do guac? Before making some guac, I enjoyed a cucumber margarita and got a taste of mama's famous soup. That's great. I would never think about avocado in chicken soup. Oh my God. I can't take credit for that one, Al. That's all grandma. <laughs> all right, you ready to make some guacamole? You bet. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna dump some fresh garlic in here. Okay. This is a traditional mocha hete. From there, you're gonna sprinkle a little bit of salt Just on top. Just a little Just bit a of little salt. Just a little bit of love. And then you're gonna use the top to go ahead and grind it in there. A mocha hete, a Mexican mortar and pestle, is made from volcanic rock. And it's the family secret to great guac. The rough surfaces help crush the ingredients, releasing their natural oils better than chopping them up with a knife. And we're gonna get in some fresh avocado. All right. And then you go ahead and mix that together. And I gotta be gentle with the oh, avocado soft. With, with some be love. Gentle, gentle. In go diced onions, lots of cilantro, and a good squeeze of lime juice. Keep on mixing there, and you got yourself some good, fresh guacamole. I'm gonna dig in here with you too, Al. Mm. Oh yeah. You make good guacamole, Al. <laughs> I've learned from the best. Elise, to be part of something like this, what, what does it mean? Honestly, I feel compelled to keep these beautiful recipes that are from, gosh, my great-great-grandparents running so that everyone that comes to our restaurant is able to taste them and to sit at our table and feel like family and just be a part of ours. Cheers.
How does a ceviche bar a little different from a, a sushi bar? It's like a sushi bar, but more Mexican. Uh huh. <laughs> this lively food court is home to several family owned hidden gems. In fact, here you'll find Holbush, a modern eatery renowned for its sustainable seafood. The chef behind this vibrant menu pairs flavors from his childhood in Mexico with the freshest of California fare. Gilberto Satina never thought he would dedicate his life to cooking, but his summers spent on the Yucatan Peninsula would later inspire a bold move. Since I was a teenager, growing up in the coastal region, I would go diving with my cousins. We would dive down for octopus, uh, we'd get lobsters, we'd get sea snails, and then he would take that back and cook it. And that was one of the first times that I felt a direct connection to food because even back then, there was a disconnect, you right. know? Food came from the supermarket. And it was the first time I saw something that was like directly from the sea and you can cook it and eat it right away. So that kind of blew my mind. Gilberto immigrated to the U.S. when he was five years old. His father, Gilberto Sr., a former civil engineer, worked various restaurant jobs to support the family. How did your family transition from that kind of grassroots sort of food service to right. a real formal restaurant? It, it really was through the help of the nonprofit that, you know, operates Mercado La Paloma. This bustling market is run by Esperanza, or Hope, a nonprofit dedicated to revitalizing South Los Angeles and helping first-time business owners. They gave us small business training, basic you know, restaurant health department training. They co-signed loans so my dad could purchase the equipment. It was my dad's dream to have a restaurant that represented our Mexican food, the food of the Yucatan, which is very distinct from other regions of Mexico. In 2001, Gilberto Sr. opened the family's first restaurant, Chichen Itza. The menu featuring traditional dishes like cunchinita pibil, salbutes, and panuchos. Lo empezamos la mamá de Gilberto y yo, o sea, mi esposa y yo. En, al principio éramos dos personas nada más. They needed help, but Gilberto was reluctant to join the family business. I didn't want to cook. I didn't want to be in the kitchen because I, I grew up in a household where we always, you know, cooking was always used to make ends meet, like a lot of, you know, immigrant families. So when we opened the restaurant and my dad asked me to come along and help him out for six months, I was front of the house. Slowly, I just discovered the cooking and that I enjoyed it and, you know, started learning from my dad. Even without formal training, Gilberto quickly learning the ropes, becoming a savvy businessman. Ten years in, Chichen Itza was thriving with dozens of employees. They even released a cookbook. Con el paso de los años, finalmente empezó a sentir la misma pasión que yo tenía por el negocio. After taking over at Chichen Itza, Gilberto was ready for a new challenge, one inspired by those summer boat trips in Mexico. Where does the name Holbosch come from? So Holbosch is a place. It's an island off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. He wanted to bring tropical, fresh from the sea vibes, along with an elevated experience, to diners in South Los Angeles. When Holbosch opened in the same market, it changed many perceptions of what Mexican food could be. We go outside of the realm of Yucatan and we do food from all different coastal regions of Mexico. Gilberto's fusion dishes allow the freshest fish to shine. Menu staples include seasonal ceviches and an octopus taco. His innovative cooking has wowed locals and critics alike. How does it feel to be nominated for a James Beard Award for this? Mm. After the shock, I think the first thing that I felt was extreme pride in my team. To a certain level, I guess it feels a little bit like validation because we're doing something slightly outside of the box. You look across Mexican cuisine and, and one of the commonalities is the avocado. Why does the avocado work so well across cuisines in Mexico, but especially your cuisine? The pairing of avocado goes extremely well with raw seafood preparations like ceviches and cocktails, and they're very bright, light, and acidic. I think avocado is the perfect complement because it gives it a little bit of, you know, creamy richness. That delicate balance is best represented in the shrimp and scallop aguachiles. And I couldn't wait to try making it. 
So agua chile is super simple. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take, we're gonna make a marinade that's gonna cook or denature our scallops, right? So we're just gonna take some, some cilantro. Uh -huh. Next up, the chili. Serrano peppers bring the heat. Persian cucumbers cool it down. There's a pinch of salt, ice to prevent oxidation, and a squeeze of lime juice. Then the marinade blends for just about a minute. Now, we're just gonna take a bowl. Go ahead and put a couple of uh, spoonfuls of these beautiful Baja California Bay scallops. Ooh, look at those. Now, we're gonna pour the marinade and hold on to the spoon for a stirring. Perfect. That's about right. We wanna let that marinate for at least five minutes. Gilberto takes his agua chile to the next level with an avocado rose. After pitting and peeling, it was time to get slicing. Your knife can be straight because your avocado is at an angle, and we're pull oh. cutting. You're just gonna do this now. Look. Okay. The key to a great rose? Super thin slices. We're hiring, you know. <laughs> okay. Now the next step. Hands, right? This we're gonna do this this motion. We're going to fan out the okay. avocado, right? So, can you see that? Oh, wow. There, there you go. Looking good there. I think that's uh, good enough to roll. You're going to start at the tip right here, okay. and you just roll this one like that. You see how that's forming a really big flower? Yes. This is a pretty advanced skill, yeah. but I think it's one worth practicing. Oh, yeah. And it's a nice party trick, you know? Sure. Impress your friends. Yeah. So, which one should we use? <laughs> that one. Made by the professional. Time to plate it up. That's looking beautiful. You're a lot neater doing this than I am. I'll yeah. take like a spoonful of them and just yeah. drop it on there and then arrange them on the plate. Ah, pro tip. And of course, the finishing touches. Wow. That is our scallop aguachile. And I help make it. Can something this pretty taste as good as it looks? Mm, that looks like a good bite. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But yet so simple. Thank you, sir. Al, it was a pleasure. Fantastic. The Haas avocado may have started out as a lucky surprise, but for decades, its popularity has been no accident. The Mexican-American culinary traditions passed down through the years have made this delicious and nutritious fruit a staple for so many of us across the country. And thanks to generations of enterprising families, this bumpy green fruit is going to have a very long shelf life. There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America. With interesting architecture, diverse restaurants, and specialty shops, it's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities. But with gentrification and all sorts of problems from the pandemic, it's no wonder that all these Chinatowns are rapidly changing. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Okay, so it's no surprise. There's incredible food to be found here in Manhattan's Chinatown, folks lining up all the time. But there used to be Chinatowns in cities and towns, big and small, all across this country. In fact, the longest running family owned Chinese restaurant is in a place you might never think of, Butte, Montana. At the turn of the century, Butte, Montana was a bustling mining town the invention of electricity leading to a demand for conductors like copper. Mining boomed, the city flourishing. The demand for labor brought thousands of immigrants to Butte. They came from so many different countries, including Italy, Ireland, and China. It was the classic portrait of the American West, with gambling, saloons, even a red light district. By 1914, Butte's Chinatown was thriving with over 60 Chinese-owned businesses. Now we're going to prepare broccoli beef. My name is Jerry Tam, and I'm the owner of the Pekin Noodle Parlor. 
The Pekin first opened as a tobacco shop and casino run by Jerry's great uncle, Hum Yao. Two years later, Hum adding a restaurant and the Pekin Noodle Parlor was born. Well, this building has three different levels. The top level obviously is the Pekin Noodle Parlor. And then the second level on the main street used to be a herbal medicine shop. That shop was run by Jerry's great grandfather, Tam Kuang Yi. And it's crazy to think that, you know, everything came over from China at one time. Like they didn't make soy sauce in America. The noodles were fried and brought over on ships because they didn't make fresh noodles. So the history of this place really holds true that this is a Chinese restaurant, you know, from Chinese immigrants. I met up with culinary historian Grace Young to learn more about America's earliest Chinatown. Where was the first Chinatown and how did it get started? The first Chinatown is San Francisco. The first Chinese came to California uh, for the gold rush and that was 1848. And uh, they came because America needed cheap labor. And so from gold rush, they ended up doing farming, mm -hmm. manufacturing, and then eventually they worked on the transcontinental railroad. And the first Chinatown formed because America wanted cheap labor, but they didn't want the Chinese to live with whites. So they were ostracized from white communities. So t talk to me about that first wave of, of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The Chinese came from southern China, from principally from the area of Canton, and there was tremendous prejudice against mm -hmm. the Chinese. They were lynched, and because the Chinese were willing to work for lower wages, they were seen as the reason why Americans were suffering so much. So the blame mm -hmm. was unfairly placed on the Chinese. In 1882, Congress signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law. It banned Chinese from migrating to the U.S. It marks the only time in American history that an entire race or ethnic group was banned from immigrating. But the interesting thing about this Exclusion Act was that there was actually exemption for Chinese tourists, students, teachers, and also merchants. A landmark court case in 1915 classified Chinese restaurant owners as merchants. And it gave them a way to circumvent the Exclusion Act of 1882. It was this exemption that allowed Jerry's great uncle to open Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, paving a path for more family members to immigrate to the U.S. and help the business. Jerry's father, Danny Wong, arrived in the U.S. in 1947 as a teenager. Ever since he was 14 years old, he's been working at the Pekin Noodle Parlor, and he just started with the simple rolls of washing dishes, and then he learned how to cook, and then he slowly just started integrating himself into, you know, managing it and working with the waitresses and the staff. Danny taking over the restaurant in the 1950s, spending years turning it into a pillar of the local community. Well, I've been coming here for at least 50 years, and you give me plenty of food, I never walk away hungry. I love coming to work because of all the people I work with. Like, they choose really nice people. And I mean, my father probably employed over 10,000 people at this, you know, throughout his whole entire life. So it's interesting to know that there's nearly five to six generations of people that, you know, have worked here. The menu at Pekin Noodle Parlor hasn't changed much over the years. We do a thing called chop suey. And what chop suey is, is tidbits of leftover uh, vegetables that were kind of mixed together in its own gravy and served on top of chow mein noodles. We've been serving it for over 110 years. Chop suey is in large part why Chinese food became so popular across the United States. Chop suey was the first time America experienced a culinary craze, a food craze. Mm -hmm. And it's starting at the end of the 19th century that there are Americans who are venturing into Chinatown. The way they got them to even experiment with Chinese food was to make a stir fry that was actually quite bland. Mm -hmm. So they used bamboo shoots, water chestnuts, onions, uh, oftentimes there was celery. For many years, Chinatowns were the only places where non-Chinese Americans could sample Asian flavors. 
Americans were going into Chinatown. Some were curious. They wanted to experience curio shops, Chinese operas. With increased tourism, Chinatowns and large cities grew. But it was a different story in Montana. Like many mining towns, Butte lost many of its workers as production slowed in the 1950s. Once the copper ran dry, then the people just started to pick up and just kind of move on, move on and move back to their families and the bigger states. As miners left Butte for new opportunities, its Chinatown disappeared. In the early 1900s, there were seven chop suey restaurants listed in the Butte City Directory. Today, only the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains open. Jerry Tam runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, Montana. People may know this is the oldest Chinese restaurant in America, but below it is so much history. Despite Pekin's historic status, Jerry says he was never pressured by family to join the business. I never learned to cook until I came back, uh, back in around 2009, because like any Asian American, you know, my parents wanted all of their kids to go to college, so we all went to colleges around the nation and to get a better education, to become a lawyer, a doctor, and what have you. But I went into fashion, and what was great about that is I got to see the world because of it. In 2004, Jerry even appearing on Bravo's Project Runway. But a few years later, family duty calling him home. And unfortunately, my mom had a stroke, so my dad needed help, you know, taking care of her and take care of the restaurant. I think it was really hard on my father because they were in a generation where they loved each other every day. And they were just best friends. After Jerry's mom passed, Jerry and his dad began operating Pekin together. He never stopped working, so he was working here all the way until 85, until he couldn't make up the stairs anymore. My father and I spent every day together. I made sure he was, uh, he was healthy all the way till the end, the best of my ability I can do. My, my father passed in November, and it was really, you know, heartbreaking. He didn't want to say goodbye to my sisters or me or this restaurant or the community. He loved Butte, Montana. Jerry now runs Pekin Noodle Parlor with his cousin, Nelson. Together, they're working to preserve a family legacy and keep a piece of Chinese-American history alive in an unlikely place. I've been asked the question, what is the future of the Pekin? And the best answer I can give you is, let's just keep it the same. Let's not change anything, because that's what people come here for. They need to have their parking spots, they have their booths, they have their favorite place to sit at the bar. I don't think they want any change, because this is a place that feels like home.
While New York City is home to America's largest Chinatown, the honor of the oldest goes to San Francisco, and that's where the Far East Cafe is located. It is one of the last remaining historic Chinese banquet halls. After a two-year hiatus, this celebrated venue hosted the 64th annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant, a Lunar New Year tradition. The occasion marking a triumphant milestone for the century-old institution. Bill Lee has owned the Far East Cafe since 1999. His daughter Kathy, working by his side as the manager. He brought me into the restaurant to kind of understand the roots of our culture. He wanted me to remember that, you know, Chinatown is about community, is about traditions, is about culture. For many in the community, Chinese banquet halls are more than just venues for special events. I feel that Far East is kind of like a second home for, you know, a lot of our patrons that come in because they feel so comfortable. So much history and so many memories, you know. A lot of patrons that have been here, they told me, they're like, oh, my parents had my red egg ginger party. It's very similar to like a baptism. And that was like 50 something years ago. And that history is everywhere you look at Far East. The ceilings, the, like my dad mentioned, the high ceilings, the moldings, the moldings are all original. And the lanterns were all imported from China uh, in the 1920s. So they're over a hundred plus years old. For the last few decades, there were five giant banquet-style restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown. But with rising rents and gentrification, most have since closed their doors. By early 2020, only two banquet halls remained. The Far East Cafe planned to celebrate its 100-year anniversary with a big celebration. Instead, it's now planning to close its doors. At the start of the pandemic, the restaurant stayed afloat by cooking meals for senior citizens and low-income residents in Chinatown. We applied for a PPP loan and we got over $200,000. We also received money from the feed and fuel program. Then our landlord gave us six months of free rent. Beyond COVID, a different type of virus brought more harm to Chinatowns across the country. Anti-Asian hate crimes soaring by nearly 340% in 2021. When this started happening, I felt very, very sad and also very angry because I'm like, why is this happening to Chinatown? Why is it happening to our community? You know, for these people to target elderly people, to push them down, to rob them, don't they realize that they have grandparents too, or they have parents that are that age, and if that happened to their parents, how would they feel? Then People saw the attacks when they watched the news and heard reports, and they got even more scared. They don't want to go out, even for special events like the Mid-Autumn Festival. We tried to invite them, but they didn't want to come. We used to be open until 10 o'clock before pandemic. Sometimes we would stay out here until midnight if we had events. Now, we can't. We can't do that. We changed the business hours to close at 7, 7.30, because safety is the most important thing. Business owners across Chinatown still face hostility. George and Cindy Chen opened China Live in 2017. We've been lucky. Uh, we've only had a couple instances where, you know, people scream uh, anti-Asian slurs. And we're concerned about our employees, you know, coming to work and and being harassed. I, I think that ignorance is uh, very unfortunate. China Live is a massive marketplace with multiple restaurants. It's in a building that once housed a banquet hall like Far East. I remember coming to a wedding here when I was in college. And there were, I think, I think literally 5,000 people in like six restaurants. But unfortunately, you know, real estate was getting very expensive. So it's not very cost effective if you don't have that business. But two years ago, the couple had to lay off 200 workers. However, with the support of partners, George and Cindy were able to pivot their business on a few fronts. We did, you know, the ghost kitchen was 
selling outside our box. So we have 10 locations in the Bay Area, from San Jose to Berkeley, and, uh, and they can order food from those ghost kitchens. Ghost kitchens prepare restaurant quality food exclusively for delivery or takeout. We sold so many Peking ducks, we didn't know what to do with all the duck fat. So what do you do? You make popcorn with it. So that's why we have a duck fat popcorn. As business picked up, China Live was able to rehire 100 workers. Despite an uncertain future, these restaurants remain hopeful that business will rebound. More police presence, people are more, as a community, standing up for ourselves, making sure that we have like the buddy system, making sure that we're together and we feel safe, that we're walking together, that we have each other's back. I mean, dining out is an essential part of life, right? I mean, uh, one more fun is to look forward to having dinner with friends you haven't seen at a new place or an uh, old favorite place. But some old favorites just can't be replaced. During the pandemic, many restaurants have shut down. Far East is now the biggest restaurant in Chinatown. If Far East closes, there won't be space big enough to host large events for the community. We were overjoyed having that Miss Chinatown USA event here, a press conference, and just being able to reconnect with the community. It warmed my heart. And my dad was just like so overjoyed that people were coming in just to celebrate. To learn more about the future of Chinese American restaurants, I went to visit Chef Lucas Sin in New York City. This savvy chef is on a mission to save mom and pop shops from closing and putting a spin on the classics. Hey, nice oh, to meet good you. To see you. All right, can't wait to yeah, talk come and in, taste. Come in, come in here, come in here. Lucas was born and raised in Hong Kong. Growing up, he had never heard of dishes like General Tso's chicken. What was your first experience with Chinese American food? Yeah. And did you go, what the heck is this? I was here for summer camp, and uh, on Tuesdays, at 10 o'clock or so, right before bedtime, this van would pull up in the front of the school, um, and you could pick between sesame chicken, general Tso's chicken, orange chicken with broccoli and fried rice or white rice or whatever it was. The first thought was that this is ridiculously delicious, where has this been my whole life? And the second thought is that what in the world is the difference between orange chicken and general Tso's chicken and sesame chicken? Why is there so much that I don't understand about this if last time I checked I was Chinese? Lucas actually studied cognitive science at Yale, but he always had a passion for cooking. His summers spent training in award-winning restaurants in Hong Kong and Japan. After graduating in 2015, Lucas opened his first restaurant with Yale classmate Yang Zhao. Junzi Kitchen is a fast casual chain that serves modern Chinese fare. But Lucas remained passionate about the Chinese-American cuisine he first tasted as a boy. 
So, so how did Chinese American food, the food that we have become uh, familiar with, how did that develop? How yeah. did that happen? Now, Chinese takeout is interesting, right? Because it's all over the United States. Yeah. So these folks come in, they yeah. Yeah. apprentice in a restaurant, right. they learn those recipes, and they then go move somewhere on else, right? To open their own exactly. restaurant. Exactly. And then their cousins come from Fujian, and then those recipes are passed on. And there's a remarkable similarity to, to, to these dishes. Despite the popularity of Chinese American food, many family owned restaurants that once dotted Chinatowns and other urban areas have been closing for years. Opening restaurants is really difficult, and running restaurants is perhaps even more difficult. These moms and dads open these restaurants so that their kids can go to university and become lawyers and doctors and television hosts and whatnot. And now that they're finally able to do that, they don't need to run these restaurants anymore, right? The li suddenly, livelihoods have changed. That's a good thing. Lucas and Young hatched an idea to help smaller businesses in 2019. Nice Day seeks out restaurants facing closure, then works with the owners to remodel the space and update the menus. The pandemic stalled the team's initial plans, but the second location in Long Island is slated to open this spring. It's important to me that these new Chinese American takeout restaurants that we're building called Nice Day work with the previous generation of owners because they have a lot of knowledge that mm -hmm. we don't. They know their customers, they know what sells, um, they know how to cook these dishes, they have recipes. You raise an interesting point, Lucas, mm -hmm. in that you talk to these retired mm -hmm. Chinese restaurant owners. I is that part of the, the, the sense of trying to memorialize mm -hmm. what could be lost? Now, preserving recipes is part of it. But the other important part is preserving the way business is done. Chinese takeout restaurants are one of the few restaurants in the world that if they're open from, let's say, 11 to 10, the work hours are 11 to 10. They don't have any prep hours. The same cooks that do the wok stir fries are also prepping during the day. It's ridiculously efficient, and it's got to do with the setup and the way that the kitchens are run. But it's also important to us that we give back to this last generation and that we can make sure that owners who want to retire can retire well and that that legacy can be preserved in a new type of American Chinese takeout restaurant. While Nice Day pays homage to popular Chinese American recipes, Lucas has been celebrated for his innovative fusion dishes. In 2021, he was named one of food and wine's best new chefs. We serve a Mapo mac and cheese yeah. here, which yeah. is a variation on that dish. It's fusiony and it's silly and it's just an attempt to do something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it betrays every chef sensibility that I have, but unfortunately it's delicious and it's interesting and it gets people talking. Finally, it's time to eat. Lucas showing me how to make his signature dish. How do we get started? So the mapo mac and cheese, the mac and the cheese elements are rigorously American. Mm -hmm. These are, this is elbow macaroni right? uh, cooked halfway. And this is Velveeta. Um, but the mapo element is going to be in the form of a mapo sauce, if you will. The last two elements that really sort of take this over the edge is um, Chinese sausage. Oh. It, it can function like bacon and some dried shiitake mushrooms that we've rehydrated. So um, to start off with, we're just gonna cut a couple of things. And this tofu, we will then put into the deep fryer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This concludes the chopping portion of our program. <laughs> Next, garlic and ginger are cooked till fragrant. Then, spicy bean paste and soybean paste are added to start the sauce. Mushroom broth is added. The mixture brought to a boil so the flavors infuse. Can I give that a try? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's here you go. So your left hand's on the walk? Yeah. Yes. I can't, I, can't, I can't get any altitude on this thing. Nothing's coming up. And that's why the pros do it, baby. At this point, everything's smelling quite good. Uh -huh. So the macaroni is going to go in, as well as the soup we just made. Once it's boiling and happy, two slices of the best of the best. Velveeta. Velveeta American cheese. Wait for that Velveeta to melt. Uh -huh. You'll see that that sauce is already beautifully tied together. We like to play this dish in 
the Chinese takeout box. Oh wow! Because it's silly. Well, um, why not? <laughs> it's fun. Boom. Some fried tofu puffs as croutons go over the top. That's a little bit of texture and the homage to the original Mapo tofu. These fresh scallions are actually really important because they cut through the heaviness mm -hmm. of the original dish. Wow. There's a little spice, the creaminess, the crunch of the, the tofu. I hope you get, yeah, get a little, little bit of the Chinese sausage. sausage, yeah. Whoa. You've never had mac and cheese like this. <laughs> Amid a global pandemic, changing family dynamics, and anti-Asian racism, Chinatowns across America and the communities that sustain them face a challenging road ahead. Every business that is open right now is still fighting for its life. And I think that the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to show our love for the community. Come to Chinatown or your local Asian American Pacific Islander restaurant, store, market, give them your business. We have lost so much during the pandemic and I think it makes us all so much more conscious that we have to protect what we love. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William France Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960. Or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists. And Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Dookie Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eater is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Dickey Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duke Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Dickey Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po' boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase Jr., and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Ducky Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china. She wanted linens. She wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. 
post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African-American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws, welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chases when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Dude continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades. From red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la dookie. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. In. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. Gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African American restaurateur is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yeah. Enjoying everything. We it's are great enjoying to everything. Good. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase to, to get, get myself my... some gumbo. When, when the service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. 
And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche Williams Forson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. 
but racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events just four years apart sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken. Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I've missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so, he, yeah. after a meal here. After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, my baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. 
Executive Chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. No, is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gently he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep. They'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh, Celebrity, normal person, worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow. That looks perfect. Now this now is you're what, a thigh person. This is, I, I know what you're person. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning is moist, crisp. Oh. Your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take this piece to go. Oh, I'm gonna pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you. Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I could come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. 
We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at b g Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and um, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas, and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here but there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ate here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activist UEP Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting our pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course, grits. 
Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward, but how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. Say cheesecake! Cheesecake! <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. You scream, I, okay, I'm gonna stop right there because I know you know how it goes. We are here at New York City's legendary Lexington Candy Shop. Happens to be my neighborhood luncheonette. And there was a time when soda fountains and diners like this were all over New York City and all over the country. Whether it's a cone, a sundae, or mm, an ice cream float. I gotta tell you, there's nothing that brings back memories like places like these. Today, we're getting the scoop and diving into the history of America's beloved sweet shops. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. It's no coincidence that here at the Lexington Candy Shop, one of New York City's most iconic soda fountains, they serve ice cream from the city of brotherly love. It's Bassett's, the oldest ice cream company in America. In fact, Philadelphia is home to many early ice cream innovations. And at the Franklin Fountain, we've got two brothers who have recreated a turn of the century fountain that celebrates Philadelphia's unique contribution to American ice cream history. We're very proud to be called soda jerks. In the heyday of soda fountains, being called a jerk was a good thing. A soda jerk is someone that jerks the handle on the soda fountain. We are the Burley Brothers. I'm Ryan. And I'm Eric Burley. Welcome. Come on in. Stepping into the Franklin Fountain is like time traveling to a bygone era. I've always felt a kinship for the turn of the century. It just feels like maybe I was there in a past life. The Burley family originally purchasing this historic property in 2002, but they weren't sure what to do with the storefront until inspiration struck. The building is really what inspired us uh, to do what we do here. It was built around 1899, and the original tin ceiling remains as well as the penny tile floor. So we really thought that a soda fountain kind of looked right for the space. There's certainly a sense of awe and wonder, sort of a, a transport through the time machine when you walk in the door, and that was really intentional. The brothers working for nearly two years to restore the space. It is not for the faint of heart to restore any old building. It's a labor of love. And frankly, we wouldn't have it any other way. It's part of the handmade nature of everything that we do here. 
The kitchen itself was a preservation element, restoring the motor on the buttercream machine, fixing the belts. You know, the restoration of the building wasn't just the facade, but it's also the back of house spaces. They also embarked on a mission to recreate an authentic fountain experience. We took a number of road trips, in part to learn about the ice cream business, and then we would always pair soda fountain tours with those. So visiting places in the American South, going down to New Orleans, going to Savannah, seeing these old-fashioned soda fountain places, interviewing the soda jerks, the pharmacists, and really learning the culture of the soda fountain was a big part of our research. Today, while we may take the simple pleasure of eating an ice cream cone for granted, that wasn't always the case. I'm Sarah Lohman. I'm a food historian, author, and ice cream expert. Let's go back to when ice cream was a luxury, largely available to only the richest of Americans. We don't think of these as expensive ingredients today, but ice and sugar historically were very rare, and so only the wealthiest people could afford them. So it was usually made in the home, and by home I mean a large grand estate, by people who had servants, and then eventually people who owned other people. We're talking about the enslaved. So you also needed that literal manpower to make it. That all begins to change in the 19th century as technology and supplies change. Traditionally, European ice cream was made with a custard base that included eggs. But a simpler style emerged in Philadelphia. I think Philadelphia is the most important city to ice cream history, maybe Pennsylvania as a whole, because we had the invention of Philadelphia style ice cream by a black man. Augustus Jackson, a black man who was a White House chef working under multiple presidents, including Andrew Jackson, is credited with advancing a new type of ice cream and method. And he came up with an ice cream base that didn't use eggs, but was just as like creamy and luscious, but could be made with less ingredients, made quicker, and he supposedly had really, really tasty flavors too. A free man. He later moved back to his native Philadelphia to start his own business. So he made it and sold it, but then he also sold it to other ice cream shops too, and became very famous and very wealthy for this new style of ice cream. Jackson's contributions made ice cream more widely available to more consumers. Philadelphia is also home to the oldest ice cream company in America, Bassett's. I'm Alex Bassett Strange, was my great, great, great grandfather that started this company all the way back in 1861. And we're proud to be here today. Bassett was the first merchant to sign a lease in Philadelphia's historic Reading Terminal Market. And the family is still there serving up scoops today. Bassett's ice cream is a 16.5% butterfat ice cream, and it's what's called a Philadelphia style, which means that it's made without any egg yolk. Innovations to ice cream production, allowing more shops like Bassett's to open up in the early 1900s, and that ushered in a new type of meeting place where folks could socialize. And then we also had ice cream saloons. Now, the name there is key, saloon, yeah, means bar. And at this time, bars were places where only men could go, but ice cream saloons were one of the first public spaces that was socially acceptable for women to go to. So to have a public space was really meaningful to women. To have a space where you felt free, to have a space where you could safely flirt. Soda fountains and parlors became even more popular and almost necessary during the 1920s. When prohibition hits and we ban the sale of alcohol, then there's really a need for these public spaces for people to gather and socialize outside of the home. And as we move into the soda fountain era, we have a lot of creativity in adding ice cream to different flavors of soda and making these incredible concoctions and sundaes. If you were a soda jerk at the turn of the century, you were kind of a local celebrity. Today, the jerks in charge at Franklin Fountain are serving up nostalgia along with their vintage creations. It's one of our newer uh, soda syrups. It's uh, made with real watermelon fruit. Come over here to our 1905 soda fountain. Yeah. Mm, that is really good. Uh, you know, I don't want to mess with that flavor too much, so I'll just go with vanilla. Uh, vanilla ice cream just 
rounds everything out nice, plays nice at the playground. And the bean specs on the vanilla show that it's made with real vanilla, not vanillin. And that's an old Philadelphia tradition of having bean specs in their vanilla ice cream. Franklin Fountain's menu focuses on classics, but they also bring back long forgotten flavors. Summer hits. Like black walnut that tend to be kind of bitter, but mixed with enough sweetness can be really unique and good. Other flavors like pawpaws, which are our native fruit here in North America. While others misses. Uh, a flavor that kind of bombed here, uh, as an example, I'll tell you, it was orange pineapple. Like we really wanted to bring back orange pineapple as an ice cream, which was really popular at the turn of the century. But the Burleys aren't just passionate about their flavors. They are working to keep a tasty tradition alive. Our business has really enabled the preservation of a couple of historic buildings here on the block. And we hope that the, the fountain and the institution of the soda fountain continues and you know, can be passed to succeeding generations of uh, soda jerks. Coming up, I visit a family-owned ice cream shop in Harlem and get a sweet surprise. Finish this sentence. Ice cream is love. Ice cream is not easy to make. <laughs> and see. <laughs> We're up here in Harlem where the forecast is partly cloudy with a 100% chance of sprinkles. Why? Because we're outside Sugar Hill Creamery where they're bringing the community together one scoop at a time. Let's check it out. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Hi, it's nice to you? meet you. That's Nick and Petrushka Larson, husband and wife, and parents to Isla, Zadie, and Nico. So let's talk ice cream. They're also the owners of Harlem's Sugar Hill Creamery, which the couple opened in their beloved neighborhood in 2017. We're gonna give you the scoop, Al. Bam! For the couple, that bam moment came after meeting up with friends in DC for some premium scoops. We had small batch delicious ice cream, and that is when it hit us that this was not an experience that we could have in our own neighborhood. The realization that they couldn't do this in Harlem was the beginning of their sweet journey. When Nick and I started dating, he always said he wanted to own a food establishment of some sort. And then this you know, moment in life kind of presented the opportunity. Patricia oversees the shop's marketing and business, while Nick, well, he develops their artisanal flavors, often looking to the neighborhood for inspiration. The great thing about having a small shop, you see in real time, oh yeah, they don't like this, <laughs> right? And, and uh, you know, and our friends from Harlem, they are not shy to be like, yo, no, no, this is no yeah. good. <laughs> so your flavors are nods to Harlem. 
to the Not to Harlem, not to our respective cultures as well. So my, I'm black, African American, and from the Caribbean. And Nick is from the Midwest and was raised on a farm. We're channeling Harlem, we're channeling childhood memories, we're channeling the way that we were raised, what we were eating. I think this is the best uh, example of channeling our neighborhood. So we have a, a, a flavor called Cafe Tuba. And where the first location is, it's like a few blocks from Little Senegal. The flavor Cafe Tuba uses coffee from Senegal. We incorporate peanut brittle and the lean pepper brownies. Mm. So it's a bit of a twist on a classic, which we like to say we make, you know, twists on classics and then all their flavors that you wouldn't expect. Many features of the scoop shop pay homage to Harlem, starting with the name. Where we're sitting right now is a neighborhood that is adjacent to Sugar Hill. Sugar Hill is a neighborhood in Harlem that at the turn of the 20th century was the, the place where a, upwardly mobile black people resided and, and came to, right? It was also the home of the Harlem Renaissance too. Many artists, activists were living here. You know, you talk about the history and homages to this neighborhood. Uh, was there some thoughts about that, that historic uh, ice cream shop, Thumford's? Yes. Just before opening Sugar Hill, Patricia learned about an iconic Harlem institution, Thumford's small group of octogenarian Harlemites that just happened to be at this conference and they were like, hey, she's opening an happy ice cream shop. This is crazy. And they're like, oh my gosh, It'll, it's like Tomford. Tomford's was in business from 1903 to 1983, located in the heart of Harlem at 125th and St. Nicholas. Unlike many early soda fountains, it catered to black patrons, providing much more than food and ice cream. It was the place that people went after, you know, church uh, on a date. And we didn't know about it when we decided to open the shop. But after we learned about it, before we opened the shop, we definitely channeled the, the history and spirit of that place here. Sugar Hill's motto, the sweet life is a love affair between community and food. And it also has a historical meaning. The sweet life is also you know, a reference to the Great Migration. You know, when people moved to Sugar Hill, they were looking for the sweet life. We wanted to give our neighbors a little bit of sweet life as well, right? Nick and Petrushka are hopeful that their spot will become the place for making family memories down the line. Later down the line is to hear stories like people talking about Tom Ford's or talking about what, you know, what we meant to them, right? To be a place where somebody could come in and say, my parents met here. What an honor. And I, think, I don't think that we take our role as, you know, the people who created this company lightly. Like, it is such an honor to be able to serve our neighbors and to also be a place that they continue to come back to. I think that a lot of us have really fond memories of going with our family um, and having ice cream on a hot summer day, or like rolling past a rural ice cream stand and it's just like packed with Little League kids. Or when you live in a city, you've got your local ice cream place that you can walk to and the whole neighborhood is there. And as for the future of Sugar Hill Creamery? With, with three kids, uh, Nick, are, are you hoping that out of those three, one of them is going to carry on the tradition? It's a tricky question. Yes, I would, but you know, I'm not going to pressure them. At the very least, we need them to work here during exactly. high school. Exactly. Okay? <laughs> <laughs>
it's time for Sunday School. Say amen, say hallelujah. <laughs> amen! Hallelujah! <laughs> my Sunday School teachers at Harlem Sugar Hill Creamery kicked off my lesson with a special treat, a one-of-a-kind flavor made just for me. You should learn to scoop with your own, uh, my own flavor. Your own flavor. My own flavor. Yeah. Wow. All of the ice cream served at Sugar Hill Creamery is small batch, each flavor taking two days from start to finish. The difference between a small batch and large batch is one is a freezer. These machines allow more experimentation with mix-ins. The reason why it's homemade and why it's better to do small batch, for example, is you have freedom to do whatever the hell you want. You're not beholden to what can fit into a automated machine that, like for example, can't put a particular like sauce in it because it'll be too thick or you know jam something you know things like that and now back to Sunday school so what's my flavor so your flavor so we've heard around the way uh -huh. that you uh, that you're a friend you're a fan of cookies and cream I am also you like sweet potato pie so I do okay so this is a combination and pecans of, well right? the pecan element is yeah. a part of the sweet potato pie but, but yeah. yes I can tell you guys are married <laughs> For my signature flavor, Nick started with a sweet cream base, then adding Nilla wafers. Blended in, made a uh, graham cracker pie crust or pecan, Ooh. Uh, roast sweet potatoes, cook it uh, down with basically it's a holiday IPA, mm -hmm. and uh, poured the beer in it, blended it up, and then made it like a custard with, uh, with eggs. Wow. A lot goes into that. A lot goes into it. And a lot goes into forming the perfect scoop. But picture-perfect scoops wouldn't be the same without one very important invention. The ice cream scoop was invented by a black man. Alfred Crawley holds a patent for the ice cream mold and disher. And that's the scoop that's like, it has a little handle that you squeeze and the thing scrapes and the ice cream plops out. Uh, but he invented that in 1897 and sort of revolutionized ice cream culture. So the side here is to form it, the tip is to like kind of scrape it, right? So if you're like just learning, the best way is just a little bit at the top, like that. Sides and boom. And you, you form it with the side. Oh, right? so you're forming the ball. The ball, the yeah, exactly. All right, voila. Ta da! Right? So, the cup, now we'll get a little rinse. A rinse. Okay, so you, you start. You can well, also uh, grab out the sides there too, because oh, it's a little, little softer. Mm -hmm. almost, oh, that's a sad yeah. scoop. No, 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 look, now good. you're going to form oh, it. Oh, now it's forming. Now you're... Mm -hmm. Now it's forming. Oh, yep, look, at, look that at that now. Oh, See? hey, now we're talking. There it is. Wow. There it is. Good. Hey, now. All right, let's taste. All, All right. right, time to taste. The Al Roker. Cheers. Well, actually... Oh, we also have a special name for it. Oh, what's that? It's uh, Your Neck of the Woods. Oh, I like it. Get it? <laughs> wow. And this, this is... This is great. Yeah. Like all Sugar Hill flavors, there's an art to naming the ice cream. For example, their best-selling blueberry cheesecake? Well, it's named for Petrushka. So this is uh, named after my wife, who's the chairperson of the board. She's the boss. This is the boss flavor. Smart man. <laughs> this, is the, this is the chief. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Mm. My work here is done. Coming up, a whimsical creamery in Las Vegas, known for its colorful creations.
You know the old saying, what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas, especially when it comes to a hot spot that's known for creating really cool desserts, Creamberry. These folks are recreating the ice cream parlor experience for a whole new generation of ice cream fans. And whether that's in person or via social media posts. Selfie anyone? I've seen some kids who can kill the burrito by themselves. Most adults, it's funny, they would share. <laughs> in Las Vegas, a few miles off the strip, is the flashy, fabulous, and insta-famous ice cream shop, Creamberry, opened in 2016 by husband and wife team Danny and Rosalina C., hoping to create a one-stop dessert cafe. We set on a mission to bring in a wide variety of crazy, innovative desserts into one place. For Danny, it was a dream come true. I've always had a sweet tooth when I was younger, and I've always loved ice cream. Rosalina, not so much right away. She favored traditional icy desserts from her native Indonesia, not American ice cream. We love sweet stuff, but we don't uh, really love like ice cream, ice cream, but more to like shave ice. I said, why don't we bring our Indonesia dessert to our menu? And just like that, Creamberry started offering shaved ice. So we have the secret ingredients, which is the sauce, the red one, that make it very good with the condensed milk, with everything fruits on top for the shave ice, and then it's a good combination. Danny's focus was on the full menu, adding unique treats from around the world to Creamberry, desserts like Thai rolled ice cream and Filipino hala hala. Recognizing the power of social media, Rosalina began posting photos and videos of their decadent creations to Instagram, and then later to TikTok. It's a practice that keeps modern ice cream parlors relevant, according to food historian Sarah Lohman. I think social media is important because, I mean, there's, there's people out there who are following ice cream places that maybe, maybe they'll go to, maybe they'll never go to, but it's like the visual appeal. Most people who buy cookbooks don't actually cook the recipes. It's like they flip through the pages to go on a journey. I think like social media and like ice cream social media lets us do that as well. One of their most eye-catching treats, the legendary cotton candy burrito, a social media and IRL favorite. Ooh, another one, maybe, ooh, look at this, the giant burrito. Oh, the birthday amazing. burrito. Yeah, the birthday burrito. I think that should be perfect for today. Hashtag genius. The cotton candy burrito proves that something savory can be the sweetest inspiration. I was having Mexican dinner one night and uh, of course eating burritos and tacos. That's where it gave me the idea, hey, why don't I try to experiment this into a dessert? And long behold, it actually worked. Rosalina was immediately impressed. I was like, man, that's a good idea. Creamberry was one of the first shops in the U.S. to offer the viral treat, but it took a few tries to perfect. As everybody knows, cotton candy is very fragile, and any type of a moisture or it would just ruin the cotton candy. The first step in the process isn't posted on social media. Spinning of the cotton candy is one of our trade secrets for our cotton candy burrito. So we, we usually spin it in the back in the kitchen. The couple's young sons also deserve a shout out for their love of cotton candy and its impact on their business. Our kids love cotton candy, so that's why that's the first time that we bring the cotton candy to our shop. So what's more important, how their desserts look or how they taste? Both. Both. <laughs> if customers come in and they're visually attracted to it and they try it, and it doesn't taste good, they're not gonna come back yeah. and, and get the same dessert. So we eat with our eyes, right? So there's always been effort and consideration to the appearance of food, but the more photographs we can take and the wider they get spread, like with the spread of Instagram and social media, I think there's been even more of a sort of focus on how our food looks on camera. And ice cream is sort of the perfect medium for that. Like you can have a really wild color. You can have this like a really elaborate sundae, or you can have something that's just like really bold and beautiful. And luckily, because it's ice cream, it all still tastes good while looking good at the same time. Other Insta and TikTok worthy finds include their made to order ice cream tacos and wild milkshakes. For Rosalina, the more social interaction, the better. We really 
love to see the comments, how many likes we got, and then, you know, like a lot of people reposted too. And those comments, good and bad, help the duo refine their creations. Sometimes people say, oh, don't put too much sprinkled candy or whatever it is. And then sometimes we take it like, oh, yeah, maybe not too much. It's maybe only a little bit. Yeah, it's very helpful for us yes. as well because then at least we can adjust what, what is necessary and to accommodate the customers. The virtual shares are sweet, but it's even sweeter when followers from around the world get to try Creamberry. We can never get enough of seeing all the smiles when the customers get their orders. Just the, the facial expression that they give us. In an era when we're bombarded with options, the simple joy of heading out for ice cream has withstood the test of time. I think that ice cream shops, spaces, parlors, ice creameries have survived because they've always fulfilled that community space and that family space. It's something that everybody can come together around. And families behind the counter will keep scooping up sweet memories for years to come. Ah, the avocado. From toast topping to sweet treats, even mac and cheese, this tasty green fruit is pretty much everywhere. But did you know the most popular variety, the Haas avocado, was developed right here in Southern California. So I came all the way across the country to find out how farmers and restaurant owners 